Well, uh, people, good morning, uh, everyone. Hello, Professor Helen, good morning. Good afternoon Hello. to you, I think. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to this uh, third lecture of the Professor Helen, uh, in which we will explain us what is the dynamics of the, at the bottom of the bubble traps. So, please, uh, let's go. Thank you, Professor Helen. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, so indeed, this is the, la the third and last lecture. We're uh, using what we have learned about uh, theory in the first lecture and the geometry of this uh, um, adiabatic potential in the, in the second lecture. We will use all that uh, to study the dynamics uh, in the bubble, either at the very bottom or a bit higher. Uh, and I will try to describe this uh, superfluid dynamics around uh, three different experiments. So again, uh, in this context, I will concentrate on using the dynamical control of the confinement geometry to be explore, uh, to be able to explore the superfluid behavior uh, in the bubble trap. And for some of the examples in low dimensional uh, system, especially in, in two dimensions. So the outline of the course uh, is the following. So I will describe three experiments. I will try, I will start with the scissors mode. I gave you a flavor of at the end of the first lecture. Then I will go to the situation where we let the superfluid rotate at the bottom of the bubble. And finally, uh, I will uh, uh, describe the effect we face in the bubble. Uh, of the dimensional reduction to the bubble and the consequences when we try to fill uh, the bubble everywhere with atoms uh, in a microgravity env environment. So for this lecture, the references are a general uh, references on uh, superfluidity, Lodi, gases, um, many body physics. And then there are references about the scissor mode. Uh, this one is about fast rotation at the bottom of the bubble, and this one is about uh, gravity compensation and filling the bubble. So I will start with a study of the scissors mode. And the idea behind this study is to identify if the gas is thermal or superfluid by using purely dynamical criteria. So why? I told you that some of the collective modes uh, of a elongated uh, gas. So it's uh, a gas where uh, I don't have the same frequency along the two directions. So in this uh, example, the omega x frequency is larger than omega y by a factor of about 1.3. So in this case, some of the modes are specific for a superfluid behavior. And, and this is a case of the quadrupole and of the scissor mode. The scissors mode corresponds to a oscillation of the main axis of the gas back and forth like a pair of scissors. And this you can uh, measure by looking at the average of the quantity, um, average value of a X and Y. So if you average the uh, ensemble X times Y along the whole distribution of the gas, with the small amplitude oscillations of the scissor mode, this average is proportional to the angle theta of the oscillation. And by looking at its evolution with time, if there is a proper frequency for the behavior of this average, then you have a superfluid. So uh, when the gas is superfluid, this average oscillates with a well-defined frequency given by square root of omega x squared plus omega y squared. So this is a scissors frequency. On the other hand, uh, if you have a thermal gas, there is no such mode. So you have just have x oscillating at omega x, y oscillating at omega y. And when you compute the average, you will have a bit node between these two quantities oscillating each at their own frequency. And so this quantity will oscillate with two frequencies omega plus, which is the sum of omega x and omega y, and omega minus, which is the difference. So this is the signature of these bit nodes of two 
quantities, which each of um, each of which uh, oscillates at omega y or omega x. Uh, so uh, the idea now is to look at the behavior of the average x y across the superfluid transition. So in this experiment, we walk at the bottom of the bubble and remember the confinement in the vertical direction can be made very tight. So we are in the two dimensional regime. So in this 2D regime, I don't have really time to explain, but the uh, superfluid to normal transition is governed by the Berezinski Kostolitaules physics, where you have a pairing of vortices and anti vortices. So I will not enter into detail, but what you have to understand is that there is a superfluid transition at some temperature. And to be more precise, the correct uh, uh, quantity that sets the transition is the ratio between the chemical potential and the temperature. So because of uh, 2D scaling properties, in fact, it depends only on the ratio of mu divided by T and not independently on chemical potential and temperature. So when this quantity reaches some critical value, so mu large enough or temperature low enough, then the fluid is expected to enter a superfluid behavior. And this should be visible in the signature of the oscillation of this quantity. So this is the idea. So uh, the scissor small has been observed in the past in a 3D gas, and uh, it has been um, looked at uh, the behavior of the scissor frequency across the transition from superfluid to thermal. So in 3D, it's just a BC, it's not BKT transition. So at low temperature, there is just one mode, which is a scissors mode. At large temperature, you see the omega plus and omega y frequency. And in between, there is a kind of shift that was observed in the group of Chris Foot. Now in two dimensions, there were predictions, where again, at low temperature, or large chemical potential, you have the scissor small. At high temperature or low chemical potential, you have omega plus and omega minus. And this time, it was expected that uh, the scissors frequency is shifted upwards to connect to omega plus and not downwards. So this was numerical predictions and we wanted to do the experiment. So how do we do that? We make the trap at the bottom anisotropic by using a change of the uh, radio frequency polarization. And the main axis of the trap, we suddenly rotate it. As we suddenly rotate it, the gas cannot follow and it starts to be out of equilibrium and oscillate back and forth across the new direction of the uh, trap. So from the pictures that we observed after uh, this uh, first perturbation, we compute the average value of x, y, we plot its time variation, and we fit with uh, a sum of, uh, of uh, oscillations. And either we find just one frequency when the temperature is very small, or we find the famous beat node between omega plus and omega minus if the temperature is large. So here is a summary of the results plotted as a function of this famous parameter chemical potential divided by KBT, uh, which is expected to be the only parameter relevant for the transition. So for this value, when it is large, chemical potential is large, temperature is low, so we, we should be in the superfluid uh, regime. And in this direction, we should be in a th with a thermal gas. So uh, this frequency here corresponds to omega plus, this one to omega minus. So at high temperature or low chemical potential, we find the two frequencies omega plus, omega minus. And uh, indeed, it's like a thermal gas. Uh, when we have a low temperature, uh, this uh, lower branch frequency should disappear. So when you see zero frequency, it means there is just one oscillation. And we find the scissors frequency for the coldest samples. But now, uh, with many of our samples, whereas we expect to be in the superfluid regime, we find uh, still two frequencies, a little bit shifted with respect to omega plus and omega minus. 
uh, in a situation where uh, there should be a superfluid. So it's um, a, a little puzzling. And to understand that uh, deep, deeper, I will concentrate on three situations. So one situation where we are clearly thermal, the one where we are clearly superfluid, and some in-between situation where it's an intermediate value for the chemical potential. So uh, the point is that with this general average value over the whole sample, uh, probably we miss some information because when we first reach the superfluidity threshold, uh, we will reach it uh, in the center where the density is larger, but not on the edges. So uh, to be able to identify the transition with pure dynamical criteria, we went to a more local analysis of the dynamics. And this is the idea. Instead of averaging x, y over the whole sample, we, we average it on a narrow um, radius uh, at a, a given distance, um, which is also deformed because the trap is anisotropic. So for each radius, Ra, we average the uh, uh, parameter xy uh, in this narrow region and now try to extract uh, if we have just one frequency at the scissors frequency or two frequencies at omega plus omega minus. So let's look at the results for the three situations. First, I'll I start with the situation where we know we are strongly superfluid. And here is a result of the fit for different values of this radius Ra. So for small Ra's, we are exactly in the center. And in fact, in the center, the superfluid mode is, is a surface mode. So the gas is not moving at all in the center. So that's why uh, the fit is, uh, is not relevant and there, there are no proper results in this region. So I mark it as gray to say that uh, in this region, it's hard to, to be conclusive. But when we are allow, uh, away enough from the center, we see a clear single oscillation at the scissors frequency and no other frequency. So indeed, everywhere along the gas, it is superfluid at the scissors frequency. Now, if I look at the opposite case where uh, I have a thermal gas, uh, I find this time for each radius two frequencies, omega plus and omega minus. And in fact, uh, if we go a little bit more in the center, this frequency is already a little bit shifted downwards. So towards uh, zero here means uh, no oscillation and, and towards a single oscillation uh, with a, a frequency closer to the scissors frequency. But now in the intermediate case where we believe we are superfluid at least in the center, what we observe is a clear threshold between a central region where just one frequency uh, is detectable and it is at the scissors frequency and no other frequency. And at the edges, we clearly see two uh, frequencies like for a thermal gas, omega plus, omega minus, a little bit shifted from their bare values. And in fact, this shift can be understood uh, with the fact that uh, the density is already quite large and this induces a little shift uh, with these uh, two uh, bit node frequencies. So in summary, with this uh, local analysis of the dynamics, we are able to identify the radius where, which, is, which splits the gas in two parts uh, with the central region, which is superfluid, and the outer region, the edges, which are still thermal. And this is just a dynamical criterion looking at the evolution with time on, of a quantity that is a signature of superfluidity and not with arguments like the density is large enough, I expect to have a superfluid and I believe it. And, and so we can still compare our observations with a prediction relying on the local density. And what we find is that uh, the threshold we expect for uh, the BKT transition is around this region. So these two thresholds are computed for slightly different hypotheses. And we find indeed that uh, the difference in dynamical behavior occurs around the region that we expect 
for uh, the superfluidity threshold to be met in terms of uh, local density or local chemical potential. So this is um, an illustration of the kind of experiments we can do in these very smooth potentials where the oscillations can be observed for a long time and you can really probe superfluidity with dynamical criteria. So let me now go to a second a experiment I wanted to, to explain uh, where I will spend a little bit more time, which is fast rotation in the bubble trap. So remember from the first lecture, I told you that a superfluid cannot rotate like a solid body. Instead, when you start to rotate it, uh, it will uh, accommodate vortices with a zero of density to be able to increase the angular momentum without violating the um, rotational flow property of a superfluid. So if you have just one central vortex, it will have an angular momentum h bar. And then when you increase the number of vortices, uh, each vortex will have an angular momentum a little bit than h bar per particle. So why do vortices enter? Because in the rotating frame, the Hamiltonian is modified. And instead of your original Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian in the rotating frame is H0 minus omega LZ, where LZ is the projection of the angular momentum along this vertical direction, and omega is the rotation frequency. So you, you see that when you rotate, it is advantageous to create vortices because it will increase LZ, and so it will lower the energy. So that's why vortices enter when you rotate. So now, uh, the, the reason why we want to uh, study rotations is that you have an analogy between neutral atoms in a rotating frame and electrons in a uniform magnetic field. So the uh, analogy proceeds uh, like that. So if you look at a, a 2D gas in rotation in a harmonic trap, uh, so this is the Hamiltonian for the harmonic trap. And this is the effect of going into the rotating frame. So in fact, uh, this uh, uh, harmonic potential, which here is written in terms of increasing the quantum number along the directions x and y, I can also write it by increases, increasing the uh, uh, quantum number uh, of particles rotating uh, in the plus direction or in the minus direction. In other words, I can find a basis to diagonalize my 2D harmonic potential, which uh, is common with the angular momentum operator. So a, a plus will create an excitation X plus IY and A minus X minus IY. So if I do that, in fact, and I explicit LZ, which is now the number of plus excitations minus the number of minus excitations, uh, the uh, Hamiltonian in the rotating frame uh, has different energies for the uh, particles rotating to the right and rotating to the left. So in the absence of rotation, it is just the same thing. And then your Hamiltonian is diagonalized like that with one ground state where nx and ny, n plus and n minus r are zero. Then two first excited states, either n plus or n minus is one three second excited states where you have either uh, n plus is two and n minus is zero or n plus n and n minus are one or n minus is two and n plus is zero. And all are have the same energy. But now when I introduce rotations, all the n plus states will be lowered in energy and the n minus states will be increased in energy. So for example, at uh, rotating half the uh, trapping frequency, then the, uh, this state here is lower in energy, and this one is larger in energy. So you can see now that the uh, n plus states will organize and will, uh, at the end, if I rotate uh, so fast that I reach the trapping uh, potential frequency, uh, all the n plus uh, states here uh, will be degenerate in energy. And so this large degeneracy in the ground state uh, corresponds to the ground state, the, the ground lander level uh, for electrons rotating in the presence of a magnetic field. 
And so uh, we have the equivalent of a quantum hole effect with neutral atoms. So now if uh, I rotate with omega on the order or larger than omega r, you can see that uh, the states here will be lower in energy. And so the system will tend to increase the rotation more and more and to be destabilized. So this I can only also see by writing the Hamiltonian in terms of x, y, and p. So this is the same Hamiltonian. This is for the single particle and this is rotation. And this one I can also recast under this form where you recognize exactly the same thing as an electron in the presence uh, of a magnetic field, which would be this uh, charge of the electron and the vector potential for the magnetic field. And so uh, the, the system is analogous to a 2D electron gas in a magnetic field. So this is why it is called a gauge field. Uh, but in addition to this uh, equivalent system, we have this term here, which is a centrifugal potential. And so the effective potential in which the atoms are is a potential which is softened by the rotation. So the atoms tend to be expelled from the trap center because of the uh, centrifugal potential. So if we have a harmonic trap, it will correct the trapping frequency by this omega square and it will lower it. So of course, at some point, if you rotate at the trapping frequency or faster than the trapping frequency, then instead of having a trap, you will have uh, the atoms uh, will be expelled from the trap center. So this is an issue because to um, address uh, quantum hole physics, you want to be exactly at the rotating at the trapping frequency. And one solution to uh, solve this problem is to replace your potential uh, initially harmonic by some harmonic plus quartic potential. So add some quartic term to the potential. So if you do that and imagine you rotate at the uh, harmonic uh, frequency, then you will cancel this term, but you will le be left with this R to the four term, like this red curve here, which will prevent the atoms from flying away when you rotate fast. So this has been uh, tried in the years uh, 2004 or so in the group of, of Jean Dalibar, where they were able to see lots of vortices uh, in a almost flat trap. But now that we have this uh, quartic potential, uh, we could even rotate faster than the trapping frequency. So if you rotate faster, then you expect to have a bump in the potential in the center and have a density that is lower uh, in the center than on the edges. And so uh, in this case, we may wonder if it is possible to completely deplete the trap center. And this has been studied theoretically because uh, you have different phases when you when you rotate a very fast in a harmonic plus quartic trap. So uh, this has been studied uh, first by uh, Weda and then by, uh, by other authors. And so this graph comes from the uh, review by Feta. Uh, if you rotate moderately, you have a vortex lattice, as I already showed you. And this is uh, this um, situation where you have singly quantized vortex uh, in a vortex array. Now, if you rotate faster, you will create a depletion in the center. So this situation corresponds to singly quantized vortices with the hole in the center. And this is what I will call a dynamical ring. And if you rotate faster and faster, at some point, all the vortices will uh, be brought to the center and you will have no more vortices in the bulk. And this is called the giant vortex, where you just have a single flow without vortices which is multiply quantized. So the question is, uh, can we um, uh, explore this phase diagram uh, in the bubble trap? Because this bubble has, of course, unharmonic terms much larger than just R squared. Uh, so we, we look at uh, what is expected in the bubble when we, re we rotate. Uh, so if we rotate moderately, we observe a vortex lattice larger and larger as rotation proceeds. But at some point, 
what we expect when we rotate even faster is that a hole uh, is created and that the atoms climb on the edges of the bubble. So let's look. So what we do is to deform the trap strongly and to stir the deformation uh, for a while, about 0.2 seconds, and then go back to a perfectly isotropic trap and look at the time evolution. So I uh, notice here that the time evolution is in seconds, so we wait for a very long time. So initially, as we excite very strongly, we have a, like a galaxy shape uh, uh, for the cloud, and then it uh, equilibrates. And when time evolves, you see that a, a depletion uh, is visible at the center. And this is stable for a very long time. So now, is it a hole or not? So to be sure, we perform an azimuthal average of the distribution. And what we see that there is a clear maximum at some finite radius, but in the center, there are still atoms. So to really completely deplete the center, what we do is to use a RF knife and to force evaporation uh, at the, starting from this stage uh, to remove the atoms which are in the center. And so doing that, uh, we find this time that we have a very nice ring uh, with a full depletion in the center. And this I can show you now with the same kind of picture where I make an azimuthal average and look at the density distribution starting from the center at larger radii. And here all the distribution is around some finite radius and there is nothing in the center. Okay, so this, in fact, is explained by the fact that our uh, radio frequency evaporation uh, cools the sample and accelerate the rotation. You just you don't have just the effect of cooling, but also an acceleration of rotation. And so uh, this is um, illustrated by this graph, where uh, in uh, X I have plotted the atom number. So when you perform evaporative cooling, in fact, you uh, go around this graph from the right to the left. When you evaporate, you go that way. And so uh, the width of the gas when you evaporate uh, is decreased. It's narrower uh, because you, uh, you cool down. But also you see that the rotation frequency that is measured is increased. And this uh, red line corresponds to the threshold to have a hole form in the middle. And you see that at some point, we cross this line. And starting from this point on, there is a nice zero of density in the center. So clearly, the rotation frequency of the gas increases during evaporation. So I want, I want to explain you why this is so, because it is not so intuitive that when you just want to evaporate, you will accelerate rotation. And it is linked to a, the polarization landscape of the uh, RF adiabatic potential in the bubble. So remember I told you that the RF coupling Omega plus is the relevant coupling in the problem. Uh, only the polarization, which is in the uh, circular plus position, will contribute uh, to the trap, but not the omega minus. And we have a quadruple trap uh, with the isomagnetic surface, which is here in blue. And the little blue arrows uh, correspond to the magnetic landscape of a quadruple field. So the magnetic field is zero in the center. When you go down, you have a magnetic field which is directed upwards. Uh, when you go up, it is directed downwards. And when you go to the side, of course, it is radial. And to this uh, magnetic landscape, we add some RF frequency, which is circularly polarized along the vertical direction, along the plus uh, Z direction. So this is represented uh, by the little red arrows and it is uniform. So everywhere my polarization is circular along plus Z. So what does that mean? When I look at the bottom of the bubble, here the magnetic field is upwards. 
So the polarization with respect to the direction of my static magnetic field is indeed sigma plus with respect to the quantization axis. That's perfect. When I go to the side, my polarization, which is upwards, is now orthogonal to the direction of the magnetic field. So with respect to the local quantization axis, my polarization is not sigma plus anymore. Instead, it is a superposition of sigma plus, sigma minus, and linear. And so for this reason, the local coupling at this point is half the coupling at that point. And now if I go completely upwards on the bubble, you see that the magnetic field direction is reversed. So with respect to the direction of my magnetic field, now the polarization is just the opposite. So with respect to the magnetic field, now my polarization, which is still upwards, is polarized sigma minus, and the coupling is zero. So in a, as a whole, the coupling along this bubble uh, depends on the uh, vertical position, and we can show that it behaves like linearly with the linear position being maximum downwards, zero upwards, and then decreasing linearly with uh, the Z position when we go around the bubble. So now, if we may remember that we have the gas downwards, which is rotating, and which starts to climb the edges, um, the consequence is that I will have an avoided crossing because of the omega plus uh, coupling, which is larger at the bottom because the coupling is larger than at some finite uh, distance, also corresponding to some finite height. So if I look at this point here, now the coupling is smaller, so my avoided crossing occurs with a smaller gap. And when I perform evaporative cooling, I do it with some fixed uh, RF knife frequency. So at the bottom, this RF knife frequency corresponds to this potential depth. Whereas if I go to a finite radius or a finite height, now the same RF knife corresponds to a deeper potential. And so I am able to keep more atoms at a larger radius or a higher uh, height than at the bottom. So you see that, in fact, what my knife does is that it evaporates more the atoms in the center than the atoms at finite height. So it will drill a hole in the center, and this will accelerate rotation because it will remove the atoms with a zero or very low angular momentum because these atoms are at the center. I, I hope you understood the, the reasoning. Anyway, you can ask questions. So uh, the result now is that the atom, uh, they flow very fast along the bubble. And so we can evaluate the velocity of this rotation by different means. One of them is to uh, perform a time of flight. So you switch off the bubble, everything, and you look at the expansion uh, of the radius as a function of time. Uh, and when you do that, you can fit uh, this expansion and go back to the initial rotation frequency in the bubble. The second method is to know that you have uh, the bubble potential, you know it very well, and you correct with the centrifugal frequency, the centrifugal potential. And just by measuring the radius of the ring, you can deduce the rotation frequency because it is the frequency that gives you this potential with this minimum because of the centrifugal force. So both methods agree. And we find that the atoms uh, rotate a bit faster than the trapping frequency uh, with a linear velocity, which corresponds to a few millimeters per, sec per second. So in this case, it's 7.4 millimeters per second. So this uh, linear velocity may seem small, it's just a few millimeters per second, but you have to compare this velocity to the speed of sound to know if it is fast or slow. And the speed of sound that you compute given the local density of the gas is only 0.4 millimeters per second. So it means that this gas, which flows at 7 millimeters per second, flows at 18 times the speed of sound in the gas. So it's 
strongly supersonic. And the momentum per particle is a few hundreds, like 337 h bar. So it's a very, very fast rotation. Uh, so it is interesting to, to wonder uh, how stable this gas can, uh, can be, knowing that it flows at speeds much larger than the speed of sound. And uh, we may even wonder if uh, the gas is still degenerate in this, uh, in this case. And in fact, it is confirmed by uh, two different uh, uh, signature. The fact that its density uh, has a shape which is a, the one of a Thomas Fermi distribution, typical for a BEC, and very different from what would be expected for a thermal gas. And the second thing is that uh, if it is a superfluid, if it is a degenerate gas, then we expect to have specific modes, as I was describing uh, in the first lecture, and as a scissors mode, for example. So uh, one thing we, we have studied in this gas is the a typical uh, deformation, a quadrupolar deformation uh, of the gas uh, to see if we can uh, see a signature of these collective modes. And so the mode we have looked at is a quadrupole uh, mode. So remember when you have a connected gas, the quadrupole mode is one of the modes that is a signature of superfluidity. And so if you have a non-rotating gas, there are two quadrupole modes, uh, but the two modes are degenerate in frequency. But when you rotate, now the two modes, they are shifted in frequency. They are not degenerate anymore. One mode is the one that, rot that has an elongated shape, so an elliptic deformation rotating in the plus direction, uh, in the direction of the flow, and the other one uh, has the same kind of elliptic deformation, but rotating against the flow. And so, uh, the, in fact, the shift between uh, the two um, quadrupole modes is directly linked to the rotation frequency. So it's, it is another way that has been used in the past to measure uh, the rotation frequency. So the technique to observe that is to uh, deform the, uh, the trapping potential uh, elliptically, rotate this deformation at different uh, probe frequencies, and look if uh, this perturbation is able to induce a strong uh, elliptic deformation in the gas. And when uh, we are resonant with the eigenfrequencies of the quadrupole modes, then there is a strong deformation uh, of the gas. And this happens at the two frequencies, omega plus, omega minus. So this is an example where the gas is still connected. So it's still uh, without a hole. And this is an omega minus frequency, it is the omega plus frequency, and they are split by omega. But now, uh, once we enter the situation where a hole is formed, uh, we will concentrate in the uh, observation of the omega minus mode, the one which is going very close to zero frequency in the lab frame. When it is non-resonant, it is a gas I already uh, shown you. And when we hit the resonance, in the same way that we have a deformation in a connected trap, here we have a deformation of the ellipse with a strong deformation. So we have uh, uh, probed the, the gas uh, with our uh, very uh, cold annulus, uh, we find a resonance which is very narrow. And when we look at the frequency of this resonance, uh, we will uh, see that we have surprises. So first, what is predicted? Uh, I will concentrate on these blue and red uh, spots here, which represent the frequency of the omega plus and omega minus modes when I increase the rotation frequency. So the omega plus mode uh, is faster and faster, and the omega minus mode, it is the one I will observe, uh, it goes more and more towards zero frequency. And when a hole appears, which is this line, it is expected to go back to higher frequencies and never cross this line. So it will. it is expected that it rotates always in the direction against the flow. So let's see what we find. 
So this is a situation where uh, we have the hole not yet formed. Uh, we find the omega minus resonance very close to zero frequency. And when we increase rotation, uh, the frequency is pushed to the right. And here the hole appears. And what you see is that now the frequency changes sign. So change sign means that instead of rotating against the direction of the flow, it rotates in the direction of the flow. So this change of sign of the uh, resonance is not expected from theory, from this graph. It is a surprise. And it is completely clear because if we look now at the direction in which the uh, deformation rotates, there is no doubt that it is rotating. Uh, we start with the vortex lattice, and do we reach the giant vortex regime or not? So to uh, elucidate that, as we cannot really observe the vortices in this experiment because it rotates too fast, we have performed numerical simulations. And in our situation, in fact, we expect to be in this situation. So in this situation, we are already uh, in the case where most vortices are inside. So if you want, there is a lot of circulation, overall circulation of the gas, but there are still vortices in the bulk. Uh, so if you count it, there is about uh, 300 vortices inside and 240 in the bulk. So we are in what I call the dynamical ring regime and not yet in the giant vortex regime. So finally, if time allows, I would like to comment on recent results that we have uh, obtained in collaboration uh, with uh, Van der Leij and Emmanuel. So I am very happy that it is uh, the result of a great uh, coffee collaboration, which is the effect of dimensional reduction in the bubble. So what is the idea here? The idea is to try to fill the bubble, fill the, the bubble with atoms everywhere. And this is interesting because uh, then uh, there are uh, specific topological effects, for example, that you expect uh, if you have a superfluid everywhere along the bubble. For, for instance, you expect that vortices come by pair because if you have a vortex flux, uh, you have a plus sign here and then you, you need to have a minus sign on the other side um, to, uh, because of the topology of the sphere. Uh, there are also uh, specific collective modes that you expect uh, in this bubble geometry, like uh, this kind of surface modes uh, that are not present uh, if you have just a flat gas. And uh, you also expect to have um, a specific curvature effects uh, in the density of the gas uh, all over the, the surface. And as I told you in the first lecture, there is even an experiment in the International Space Station that tries to fill uh, such a bubble with atoms everywhere uh, to explore this kind of physics, even if it's a, it's a hard job. So uh, I don't want to go to space. Uh, and I would like to know if it is possible to uh, fill the bubble everywhere but on Earth. And so for that, we need a mechanism to compensate for gravity. And uh, fighting gravity now will take advantage of what I told you just before on the uh, uh, inhomogeneity of the RF coupling. So remember, I told you that the RF coupling is maximum at the bottom and is zero at the top. But now if I sit exactly on the resonance surface, uh, the potential, which is square root of uh, detuning square plus uh, coupling square, if I am just at the surface, the detuning is zero. So the uh, adiabatic potential is just equal to the coupling itself. But the coupling varies with Z. It has a minus Z contribution. So if I add this varying coupling plus MGZ, which has a plus Z contribution, and I choose appropriately the value of omega zero, 
such that it just compensates for the uh, gravity difference between top and bottom, then I expect to have everywhere the same potential all over the bubble. Uh, so potential zero everywhere. So it's not completely uh, position invariant because I, as, as I told you, the confinement is stronger when the coupling is lower. So it's a, a potential which is equal everywhere, but with a strength uh, to the bubble, which is uh, larger at the top than at the bottom. So we tried that and tried to fill the bubble. So here is what happens. Uh, in, this re in this series of pictures, you have an image of the cloud seen from the top. So the uh, red uh, uh, dashed line corresponds to the largest uh, radius of the bubble seen from the top. And below here, you have a gross Petyevsky simulation of the same distribution at zero temperature, just to compare. So this is experiment. This is theory, all that seen from the top. And this is the same theoretical distribution seen from the side, just to illustrate where the atoms are expected to be in the bubble. So we are uh, initially at the bottom of the bubble with a, singly, uh, in a single cloud uh, at the bottom. And now we start to compensate gravity. And we do that by reducing the radius. And so the bubble shrinks. And you see that the atoms spread more uh, towards uh, upwards and uh, more and more at the bottom of the bubble. So at some point, we can fill uh, half of the bubble uh, with this technique. And now at this line here, it corresponds to gravity compensation. So we should expect that it will fill the bubble everywhere and have the atoms uh, everywhere in the bubble. But this is what happens. Instead of filling the bubble, the atoms remain grouped uh, all together, and they end up by forming a ring around the equator. Uh, although here we have uh, no energy difference between that point and that point. And here, in principle, we, we even overcompensate gravity. So the atoms should be pushed to the top. So what's happening? Uh, probably there is another effect uh, in the energy. There is ju not just uh, the Rabi frequency and gravity. So it could be an effect of the curvature, as I mentioned, because the curvature will contribute with a little offset, a quantum effect, to the, to the potential. And so for that, we have to compare the radius of curvature at the top and at the equator, because they are not the same. And if we do that, we find that the energy difference because of curvature is very, very small, like two hertz, whereas our chemical potential is 500 hertz. So it's, it is much smaller than what we can detect. So it is not this effect. Instead, uh, I told you that the trapping frequency to the bubble is not uniform. It is larger at the top and lower at the bottom. In fact, it scales like the gradient divided by square root of the coupling. So if you uh, start from the bottom, uh, the uh, frequency, the trapping frequency to the shell decreases from the bottom to the equator and then increases from the equator to the top and is minimum near the equator. So what explains the trapping around the equator is the zero point energy of the transverse confinement. In fact, the atoms uh, are in a 2D situation where they are strongly confined to the bubble and so they have an offset energy, which is the zero point energy of the transverse confinement. So in addition to the potential uh, that I had before and where I tried to uh, compensate gravity with uh, H bar omega zero over R zero. So this term I can cancel, but I still have this term. And this one is the one that confined the atoms near the equator. And as uh, the uh, coupling is zero at the top, it means that the trapping frequency, which scales like one of a square root of the coupling, diverges and provides a very big barrier which prevents the atom from reaching the top. So if I look at what I expect taking into account this effect, so this is as a function of the angle uh, around the, the bubble. This is the top, this is the bottom. And so I expect to have a minimum around the equator with a big barrier preventing the atoms 
from reaching the top. Uh, so in, inside this, this kind of ring, we still have long lifetimes for the atoms, like a few seconds. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, uh, in this kind of simulation uh, done for the internal space station, in fact, the fact that the atoms, the atoms accumulate at the equator is not really linked to a curvature effect, but it's more a, this effect of a change of the transverse confining to the bubble, which plays a major role. And what we have observed should also be true in the International Space Station and will make very difficult to have the bubble filled everywhere because you also have to take into account this effect. So let me go uh, to my conclusion now. Uh, I have shown you that uh, with these adiabatic potentials, uh, you can uh, study lots of physics related to uh, superfluids. Uh, first, I have shown you the eigenmodes of a 2D Bose gas, and I have concentrated today on the scissors mode, which is a signature of superfluidity, and that we have used to probe locally the superfluid character of the gas, showing that you have a core which is superfluid with edges which are thermal. And so one outlook of this work would be to try to identify a, a jump in superfluidity with uh, this kind of, uh, of measurements. Second, I have shown you uh, that by rotating very fast uh, in the bubble, we go from the situation where we have a vortex lattice to the situation where we have a dynamical ring. And so one prospect to, uh, here would be to try to reach a, the giant vortex regime. Uh, so in our situation, to be able to have a giant vortex, we would need to reduce a lot the number of atoms. And the challenge is to detect them in this case. So it's not uh, uh, really easy. We should have like 400 atoms. And uh, we have to change the detection sensitivity to be able to, to see them. But another... a prospect for this uh, dynamical ring is also to probe its uh, stability. Because I told you that the flow was uh, going at speeds much, much larger than the speed of sound. And for the flow to remain stable for a more, almost one minute, we need to work uh, very strongly in the uh, uh, rotational invariance of the bubble any small deformation of the bubble leads to a damping of this rotation. So one uh, outlook for this experiment is to try to measure the destabilization of the flow. If you, uh, for example, uh, add some obstacle uh, on the, uh, inside the flow or uh, induce intentionally uh, some deformation. And also, uh, one uh, important thing to explore is this uh, excitation spectrum, where we have seen that there is a puzzle and that the uh, frequency observed uh, is uh, with the negative sign and not a positive sign. And finally, I have shown you that uh, we can create a ring by a compensating gravity in the bubble. And we have evidenced the effect of the quantization of the transverse degree of freedom that leads to a special localization in the bubble, uh, whereas you would expect naively to have uh, filled the bubble uh, everywhere. So these results are very relevant for experiments uh, in microgravity. So I would like, before I, I end, to thank uh, my collaborators who have participated in these experiments. Uh, so for the CISORS experiment, uh, uh, Camilla De Rossi is the main force. And uh, for uh, the uh, ring uh, and the fast rotation experiment and the bubble, it's more uh, Yan Yang Guo, uh, who already visited uh, uh, Van der Eyck's group in, in 2019, I think. Um, and uh, I would like also to mention uh, all the department staff uh, uh, in the group, and especially Romain Dubessy, who has taken the lead in this experiment. Uh, the current PhD students are David Ray and Richard Sharma, who is there uh, in San Carlos. And I would like to acknowledge collaborations, uh, and especially 
the collaboration with Mandalay, who has uh, led to uh, the last results on the uh, gravity compensation in the bubble. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Helen, for his wonderful talk. We have a few time for questions. Professor Vanderley. Hi, Helen. Very nice yeah. talk. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, can we do a nice thermodynamics of this uh, bubble? Because you see, the trap is like a bubble, but it's not fully occupied, right? As you said, it's very hard to occupy. So uh, maybe we can uh, do a thermodynamics where we're going to introduce an extra variable, which is the occupation of the, of the trap, you know, because you have some escape uh, positions, and then uh, the atoms are going to try to be uh, far from the escape, right? The poles or... Uh, so, you have any thoughts uh, about uh, doing a thermodynamics of the equilibrium of the system? I think to do that, you really have to take into account the fact that the trap depends on this angle theta. And so, it, it's not directly the um, thermodynamics of a bubble. Uh, it's a specific thermodynamics of, of this system. Uh, where uh, you can, for example, uh, more or less model it uh, by some uh, ring with very thin uh, radius and larger uh, spread along the vertical direction. It's uh, closer to that. Uh, and if you go uh, to uh, the intermediate regime where uh, you uh, occupy most of the bottom, so uh, in the, around these lines, you have a thermodynamics of uh, something like a, a half sphere, uh, but it's not the topology of, uh, of the sphere. It's something uh, uh, very flat. It's like a curved uh, 2D gas. So this you can do, but you really have to take into account the complete potential. And it was really important for us that we describe the potential very accurately to be able to match the experimental results. And the reason for that is once you have compensated for gravity, essentially you expect that the energy is uh, degenerate everywhere. So any small uh, energy shift will change dramatically the density distribution along the sphere. And this is why the small effect of a transverse uh, trapping is now what is dominant in this situation. That's because the main energy uh, scaling, which otherwise is gravity, has been cancelled. So any small effect is uh, takes a very uh, big importance. Professor Patricia. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Thank you for Hi. the very nice lecture. So I have two questions. So the first one is about the omega minus mode in the quadrupole oscillation mm -hmm. you show, uh, that it uh, goes from negative to positive, yes. And then you say it's clear, we clearly see that uh, it's rotating in the forward direction. So I think we lost uh, this explanation. I didn't understand, actually. I okay. wanted yeah, to... Yes, of course, because you don't know um, in which direction my gas is rotating, whereas I know it. <laughs> in fact, uh, because we, we know what we do for the excitation, and we know in which direction we apply the excitation, uh, we know that the, direction, the excitation is applied uh, in this figure, it is applied in the uh, anti-clockwise direction. The, this is a direction in which we apply the deformation. And so the, we know that the gas rotates to the left, if you, if you prefer. And so uh, the omega minus mode initially is expected to create a deformation, this kind of deformation. But the gas inside the deformation rotate to the left, but the deformation itself 
is expected to rotate to the right. So if you, if you want, there is a very fast uh, flow inside this figure, and this figure itself slowly drifts to the right. So this is a case for all this point here. Okay. When you pass this, uh, this line here, you still have a gas flowing to the left very fast, but now the deformation is also rotating to the left. And, and if you are exactly at this line, what's happening is that you have a gas rotating very fast inside this ellipse, but the ellipse stands there, you see? So this is the difference between uh, the rotation of the mode and the rotation of the gas. And I know that my gas is rotating to the left. And when I take pictures one after the other uh, at different times, I see that my deformation also goes to the left. So I can see it with my eyes. Whereas here, what I observe is uh, the deformation in terms of ellipticity uh, when I apply a perturbation uh, in the frequency for different frequencies. So when I change sign, it means that my perturbation is applied counter-rotating or co-rotating. Okay. Thank and you. so you had a, another question? Yes. So the other question is more about uh, your future perspectives. So I was wondering how are you going to use the scissor modes to uh, connect to the superfluid density? that you mentioned. Okay, so this, this uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not evident. Um, I, I, it, it would require some additional theory to do that because um, we, we may wonder uh, that uh, maybe be, uh, at some point here, you, ah, okay. you know that the, mm. so it's more this graph. Uh, the frequency is already a little bit affected. Mm -hmm. uh, so here it is uh, not completely omega plus, and here uh, there is some uh, uh, some change. So, so we know exactly where in the gas it happens. Uh, now the point is to be able to connect it to the superfluid density. Mm -hmm. And so this is what is not clear and has not been done. And the point would be to be able to make a relation between this value mm -hmm. and the superfluid density. And I think it's possible, but it has not been done. So here again, it's some open question. And meanwhile, there were experiments uh, looking at uh, second sound. Yeah. Uh, but in a, it was in a homogeneous gas yeah, yeah. by... Uh, uh, Zoran Hadzibabic, was he able to identify the superfluid jump using, again, using some, some model, okay, uh, some second sound uh, excitation. So maybe the scissors is not the most appropriate. Maybe in, when you are in a trap, you need to identify something which is the analog of the second sound for collective modes uh, to uh, be able to uh, have access to the superfluid de density. So I don't have really the, the answer to your question. Okay, thank you, Len. More questions? Well, I am going, yeah, see. Uh, I'm going to pass to the question on the people on YouTube. So we have one from uh, Gustavo, uh, Helen, congratulations for a selecting presentation. I would like, to come back to the supersonic BC and ask you, how do you understand the Mach-18C movement of the BC? It is the new ground state? Uh, yes, it is a new ground state. Uh, so, so where was it? It was there. Um, so in fact, uh, as I sh have shown in also with the Kospitaevsky uh, simulation of the gas, if you prefer, this is this graph here. Uh, this is the ground state of the gas in a rotating frame. And so uh, what flows at Mach 18 is this overall gas, uh, which um, is, uh, is supposed to carry a lot of vortices inside. So you should not imagine that we have a laminar flow going at Mach 18. 
It's the overall gas with lots of vortices inside that goes at Mach 18. And it is still uh, supposed to be the ground state in the rotating frame. Nevertheless, uh, the stability of this flow is questionable. And we, what we have seen experimentally that we really have to work hard on the uh, rotational invariance to be sure that this uh, uh, flow will be stabilized for uh, most one minute. So although it is a, the ground state, uh, it is a very fragile. Uh, so one of our goals would be to, to look at its stability when we deform it uh, in a volunteer way, when we, we apply some deformation. So it's not like having a laminar flow, uh, which would be metastable uh, and flowing at uh, Mach 18, and then any small obstacle will start to create vortices. Vortices are expected to be already there, just to clarify. Okay, thanks. And the second, I mean, this, there is a second part of the question. He asked if it is possible to directly evaporate and make the BEC in this new ground state. Um, it's maybe more or less what we do because of this uh, evaporation mechanism that I was describing here. Uh, we, we need to apply this mechanism to really reach uh, zero density in the center. So if we uh, do not apply the RF knife, uh, then we do not really drill the hole. So that's why it's more or less the ground state because the, the knife is there, okay? Uh, but uh, starting from a thermal gas, it's another story uh, because uh, to be able to uh, to prepare this gas from a thermal gas, you need uh, enough collisions, whereas the our density is not so large. Uh, so um, maybe, yes, uh, maybe that's what we do. Uh, that's an uh, ambiguous uh, answer, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Helen, and let's thank the professor, please. Thank you for your attention. You're welcome, you, and I will send you the, the slides of the presentation by email. Okay, thanks, Professor. Bye. Now we have Vita's third and last lecture. We have kind of a, a betting a pool going on to see how many bodies you can do today. <laughs> I don't want to bias your talk, but if you at least flash the uh, equation of state for unitary both matter, I can buy you lunch. Uh, as opposed to the last few days, huh? Um, well, uh, thanks for the brave souls that are uh, still here for this last uh, lecture. And um, I'm going much slower than, than uh, I had hoped. I only went through half of my slides, so I have to go twice as fast. Um, I'm not going to do that in the beginning of the lecture, but uh, at the end I'm going to, to cut some slides. So to remind you of where we were before, um, I covered these four, uh, this first four items here. I, um, first, I looked at the um, two-body system and I showed how we can treat that uh, systematically with an effect field theory. And then uh, I start talking about uh, few-body systems uh, and uh, discuss two methods of solution 
uh, two, two broad methods of solution very briefly and uh, want to, this, to, to attack the main issue, which is the relative importance of field body forces. So I introduced this auxiliary field and in a lippmann schwinger type uh, approach, I looked at the equation for the scattering of an atom on a dimer represented by this auxiliary field. And I end up with an equation uh, which has been known for a long time, the skorniakov termatirosian equation, uh, which depends on a parameter lambda that tracks the uh, nature of the particles, whether they're fermions or bosons. And in particular, um, well, then after I started looking at the uh, ultraviolet properties of the amplitude, because if uh, there is dependence on the cutoff, then it signals that I need uh, three-body force at that leading order. Um, with a certain insights about the behavior of the uh, T matrix, one gets an equation for the power of this amplitude with uh, the momentum. Um, so now I'm going to specialize for the different cases. Um, I will start with two component fermions and then go into bosons and that I hope at least to, to cover everything and then for com component fermions I probably only flash a couple of slides. So uh, if you solve that equation that, that I mentioned before for lambda equals minus a half you find that the power, the asymptotic power should be some number 2.17. Uh, which means that the amplitude at large momenta should go as 1 over p, as if s is 2.17, should go as p prime to the uh, minus 3.17. And indeed, if you do, say, if you, if you calculate the equation explicitly on the computer, and, uh, you are going to see that, of course, the behavior is a bit dependent on the regulator, but asymptotically has this, this power. And then if you go towards lower momenta, you see that the solution is independent of the regulator, independent of the cutoff. So that, because the amplitude goes so fast uh, with momentum, goes down so fast with momentum in the ultraviolet, that means the amplitude in the infrared is well behaved with respect to the cutoff. There is no, approximately no cutoff dependence. So that means that the three-body force is not necessary at this order. And as you'd expect from, uh, just from its uh, dimensions. So that means that you can, to up to the order where three-body forces appear, you can predict three-body results from three-body physics. So one example is uh, the spin three halves uh, neutron-deutron scattering uh, data. You can, uh, so uh, of course, nucleons I mentioned before are four component fermions, but if you impose that the three of them have spin a half, so effectively uh, the spin doesn't play a role, and what you have is that you have in this case neutron neutron scattering, two neutrons and one proton, so you have effectively in a situation of two component fermions, everything is well predicted, and as you can see from uh, if I plot k cotangent delta, delta is a phase shift as a function of essentially the energy. You can make a prediction for leading order. You can pre make a prediction, in this case I'm showing n square L O, uh, and you can compare to, to data. And right here at, at zero energy you have the scattering length, so you can see how the scattering length converges. So these are all calculations and with no free parameters. Everything is obtained from the two-body system as I uh, discussed in the previous lectures, and you can compare with the, with the data, you see that it's right on the nose. So you can do similar things for more than three particles, and uh, so you can predict things with two-body input alone. For example, uh, Dima Petrov and, and collaborators calculated the, uh, the dimer dimer scattering length in terms of the scattering, the two-body scattering length. And if you convert this, if you assume the effect of range expansion truncated at the scattering length and convert this into momenta and energies, you're going to see that there is no evidence for any 
uh, bound tetramer, as you uh, would expect from the following argument. So, uh, rem I remind you that we are considering situations where the scattering length is large, we are close to this unitarity limit, and we discussed last time how the unitarity limit um, brings in scale invariance at the two-body level. Now, if there is no three-body force, uh, no four-body force, or no any any body other any body force at uh, leading order, that means that scale invariance should still you would expect scale invariance should still hold. Um, no anomalous breaking of scale invariance, and therefore the same argument that I had for the two-body binding energy you can carry out for the n-body energy, namely that I don't have a bound state. Unless, of course, I trap the system somehow, like with the gravitational field in a neutron star, or, or like you guys like to do in a, uh, in a trap, atomic trap, that breaks scale invariance because you introduce effectively another parameter with dimensions that sets, uh, effectively sets a volume, which means then that you have a, a density coming from the number of particles that you have in this volume. You have a Fermi momentum, which is a dimensionful quantity, uh, but you still can use arguments of, of scale invariance, taking into account this breaking only by the, uh, the external, uh, external potential. And the nicest example is uh, uh, provided by George Birch when you look at the energy per particle for, uh, for, a, for, a large, for a system with a large number of particles. Because Kf is the only dimensionful parameter, then the energy should be a multiple of the free Fermi gas energy. And this, uh, this factor here is known as the Birch parameter. And because of that, and, uh, then you can account for the breaking from higher orders, if you will, uh, uh, from the scattering length for effective range and so on. And you have other dimension less parameters that characterize the the dynamics of this system. And so these are universal numbers that do not depend on the type of, of, of uh, uh, two-component fermion you have. And you can, one can calculate these numbers, and these numbers have been calculated. So here are some uh, the, the, the typical values people get. Um, so this is uh, very neat, but to some extent, because there are no, no pure bonds, they, no uh, untrapped bound states, to me is not as interesting as the next case, which is bosons. So for bosons, that parameter lambda is one, and when one solves that equation, when we, f we find that the power of the momentum is imaginary. Well, power that's imaginary means an oscillation, and uh, it's imaginary times a number, a constant of nature, S0, which is about one, but not exactly one. And uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that if I now solve the equation numerically, not only look at the asymptotic limit, but look numerically, if you start with a certain cutoff, you see that you're going to have an oscillation. You start at a different cutoff, you have another oscillation. And the... Uh, so the asymptotic limit is what's given by, uh, by this number, so it's going to be an oscillation, uh, as you know, but then what you observe is that at low energies, you can get anything you want. So that means that the results are sensitive to the, uh, to the choice of the cutoff, so you're not renormalizing the problem correctly, which then is an indication that you need a three-body force at this order, which is leading order. Now, this was actually, this could be inferred from a much earlier result by Thomas, sometimes referred as the Thomas collapse, that if you look at the bound state, then you're going to find that the binding energy grows with the cutoff squared. Uh, that's true for the ground state, and then excited states appear at larger lambda. So nothing is independent of the cutoff and of the regulator, uh, without the three-body force. So 
what's happening intuitively is something like this. You, you arrange your two-body force to get your two-body system to be fine-tuned to have this large distance. But when you go to the three-body system, the number of inter two body interactions grows faster than the, the number of, of, of particles. And therefore, the system tends to collapse, uh, which, which is a Thomas collapse. So you need a three-body force to effectively um, stabilize the system. So then let's go back to the equation. We add a three-body force, which I'm representing as, as interaction of the atom with the dimer, short range interaction of the atom with the dimer. So you have to add all the diagrams so that you get a different uh, integral equation. We got such an integral equation at the end of the, the 90s. So it's essentially it's the thermaterial, uh, Skorniakov thermaterials in equation with a three body force. And um, we can write this three body force for convenient in this form here to, to, to have a dimension, to have the uh, dimensionless age. And you now see that the asymptotic equation is modified. It's not only this term times this, but it has the extra contribution from the three body force. And that this extra contribution for the three body force in the ultraviolet when L is of order lambda is only important when P prime itself is of, of order lambda. So that means that the contribution of the three body force essentially fixes the phase of that oscillation at P prime smaller than lambda. So you expect the solution to have a form like this with a phase that is given so this is what you had before, but now you have a phase that's given by the, the three-body force, and we can define that, that phase as a definition as S, uh, uh, that, that parameter as zero log of lambda over lambda star, where lambda star is now a physical dimensionful parameter. And uh, this is beyond the effect of energy expansion as advertised before. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. So this is the plot that I had before the three-body force. Once I have the three-body force in the form of this parameter lambda star, I can adjust it to give a, a specific, whatever data tells me, specific value of the, say, the scattering length. And now for different cutoffs, the curve oscillates as it should. But when I start at a different cutoff, let's say this one here, there's a small difference at, at large momenta, but then it falls essentially on the same curve. So the asymptotic behavior now is given by an oscillation, but that oscillation is fixed by lambda star, by this physical parameter. And, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and at low energies, the results are independent of the regulator now. That means the system has been renormalized properly. So um, now I have a three-body force, a leading order, with this one parameter, which in the previous slide I fitted to, to the, the three-body scattering length, so the scattering length of the atom on a, on a dimer. And now I can look at what the binding uh, energies are in this case, and you are going to have some set of binding energies, and here is an example. Um, you, in general, we're going to have a ground state that converges very quickly with respect to, to the cutoff, and you can have, uh, oh, sorry, this is the shallowest state, and then you are going to have uh, other states that uh, uh, are more sensitive to, they have a higher binding energy, a bit more sensitive to the short range physics, and that some, only some of those will be within the, uh, within the effect field theory. So in this particular case, if, if the breakdown scale is around here, then it, I would have two, two states. This is a situation that we have, for example, in helium-4. Um, now, if I look at the, any one state, let's say this one here as a function of, the, um, as a function of, uh, uh, of lambda star, and lambda star can be, can be translated into A3, if I vary lambda star, I vary both A3 and B3, so I observe a correlation between these quantities, which is called the Phillips line. Uh, this was discovered by 
Phillips uh, in the late 60s in the nuclear case. So situation is a bit different, but uh, there people played with various potential models and they noticed this correlation between A and B, uh, which went through more or less through the experimental point. In the effect field theory, you have this correlations, uh, they are lines, and here I'm showing leading order in, in, in exo leading order. Um, but uh, the, the main physics is simply that I'm varying this one parameter, so that I have only one parameter, so any three body, uh, any pair of three body observables that I look at will be correlated by a change in this parameter. So in summary, I have a three body force. Um, that has to depend on the low energy scale in order to be leading order. Now, I'm not going to go through the arguments about NLO, but one can show that NLO, uh, you do not need a new three-body force. Uh, at NLO, if you remember in the two-body system, I have, uh, say, the effective range contributing, but the uh, contributions of the effective range can be uh, the three-body system absorbed, I mean, the dangerous contributions, the, the, um, the cutoff dependence can be absorbed in the same parameter. So we simply have the same three-body force with a corrected parameter. And it's been shown, no, I forgot to put the reference here, that uh, a new uh, references, that there is a new three-body force at n square low. So a three-body force with two derivatives here appears at n square low. So you could have said, well, I don't really need this three-body force. I can only work with a fixed cutoff, and that's true at, at leading order. But once you go to n square low, you see that you need a, a new parameter, and that is the easiest way to incorporate this is through the three-body forces that should be there anyway. And then the three-body forces allow me to go to larger systems. Before I do that, let me go back to my example of helium four atoms just to see how it works. This is a slide that I showed before for the two body. Now I'm going to go to the three body. So what I'm going to do is to use the excited trimer, helium four trimer, as the input. So I'm going to use uh, the properties of this, this state as the input. And I'm going to predict the um, uh, binding energy of the ground state and compare with the potential models to see how well it works. So first of all, uh, I calculate the, uh, the, ener the binding energy of the ground state divided by the binding energy of the uh, excited state. It converges with the cutoff to show that uh, the problem is renormalized and uh, converges very nicely. I can extrapolate to large cutoff to to see what my prediction is. And here's my prediction when I use B2, binding energy of the dimer as input, when I use this, the two body scattering length as input, it changes a little bit. Uh, and this is the comparison with the direct calculation with uh, this potential L M2, M2. Uh, similar here for this other PCKLJS potential. So you see that there is, uh, there is very little uncertainty coming from the cutoff extrapolation, but there is an uncertainty coming from what I use as input. And that's just a reflection of the next leading order, uh, the, the error that I have in my theory, which is a next leading order, uh, the, the, the size of the next leading order effects. And you see then that we get within, uh, let's say 20%, in leading order within 20% of the direct calculation, which is better than the estimated error uh, of 40%. So the effect field theory, of course, is not working as well as a two-body system, but it's still way uh, working better than you would expect. Um, you can go to, to NLO. Um, NLO, like before, I use A2 and R2 to fix the two-body parameters. And then I still keep the, the uh, excited energy, the excited trimer energy as input. And then I can see how the uh, binding energy converges, though of the ground state converges to the direct calculation. This is for this, this particular potential here. 
So you see the error of 20% at leading order goes down to 10% at NLO. And people braver than me have uh, looked at N square LO. And an example here is uh, now you need an extra parameter. So at the at three body level, so they took the scattering length to be fixed. And just to see how the conversions go, so again, this is k cotangent delta as a function of k now. And you can see LO, NLO, N square LO, how this converges. So the theory works pretty well uh, in this, uh, this particular case. Um, now, to, more inter to something that's a bit more interesting, in my opinion, is that well, uh, we have this, let's go back to leading order. We have this three body force with this one parameter. One can actually have an approximate form for this, um, for this three body force. In term, uh, we can have an approximate uh, form for that H that appears in the, in the equation. I'm not going to derive it here, uh, but it's quite neat form it's, uh, and it's quite insightful because it's a ratio of signs of S0 log of the cutoff over lambda star. So that's what the, the coefficient of the three-body force is. Lambda star, of course, is this dimension full parameter. So if I plot this, this, this uh, analytic form for the three-body force, that's the solid line, and the points are actually the result from the numerical evaluation. I mean, I find out numerically which three-body force I need to, to get say the fixed scattering length, and you see that the analytic form works pretty well. Um, and it gives us an insight because you see that the three body force is periodic under a change of the cutoff. It's periodic with this factor of exponential of n pi over s zero. So this is what in uh, the language of the renormalization group is called a limit cycle. And this was a big deal to discover this limit cycle because people have speculated that limit, well, limit cycles have been seen in other dynamical systems, but in Wilson speculated in 1971, uh, Ken Wilson, that limit cycles should play a role also in quantum field theories, but this is the first example, this was the first example of an RG limit cycle in a quantum field theory. A non-relativistic one, but still. So what are the, impl the implications of this limit cycle? And here is, the, I think, the most interesting aspect of this, is that it breaks scale invariance that I talked before in the two-body system to discrete scale invariance. So if I now look at my action with the three-body force, my action at leading order with the three-body force, this first two terms is what I had before in the two-body when I discuss a two-body system in continuous scale invariance. Now I have this extra term with a force that has this form here. So if I try to do a scale transformation to the system, I observe that the action is still invariant with the caveat that now this parameter, which before was continuous, now it takes discrete powers of a certain factor which is exponential of pi over s0, which is a factor of 22.7. So th that's why we call this discrete scale invariance, is a scale invariance we had before, but with a parameter that can only take certain values. So what is the uh, effect of this? So I use the same argument that I had before, my energy gets transformed with the scaling factor of minus two, alpha to the minus two, but is now a set of discrete values of alpha. So before, if I uh, did not, when I had a continuous scale invariance, this had to be the same as what I had before, and that implied that the binding energy was zero. But now I have the possibility that the binding energy is one another discrete, discrete value. So this is consistent with the scale invariance. And then I can solve this equation and I find a tower of states. And this tower of states was obtained in a different way long time ago by Efimov. 
uh, and it's known uh, as the theme of uh, tower of states, geometric tower of states. So the situation, remember when I talk about continuous scale invariance, I brought up elephants and people like that. Uh, here the analogy is, oh, before I go there, this factor here is 500 because it's a square of that 27. Um, and I should mention that in a physical system, we have only, um, we are going to have a ground state. So we are not going to have this infinite tower, but a semi-infinite tower starting from the ground state. So the situation is a bit like what we have, uh, discrete scale invariance in this case, it can be illustrated by this, this Indian temple here. Um, you need a basic scale that sets the relative sizes of, of the different steps in this tower. That is set by this quantity lambda star. And then there is a factor, in this case is maybe 1.1, that relates one step to every other step, and every other step is more or less the same as the step before. So um, this way, a discrete scale invariance still has an effect in the spectrum. Um, but it's, uh, it allows for this tower of states. It does not simply impose that there are no bound states, as is the case for scale invariance. And that, in my opinion, is what makes a system of bosons so interesting. So um, uh, this is frequently summarized. This situation is frequently summarized in this ephema of plot. Uh, what is this? Uh, this is a plot of the binding energy of the three-body system, uh, the binding energies of the three-body system scaled by this lambda star quantity. On the uh, horizontal axis is essentially the two-body scattering length. And um, this line here then is the threshold for breakdown of the three-particle system into a one plus uh, atom plus dimer. So what's seen here is atom plus dimer. What is to, this, uh, to the left of this line are bound states, um, three-body bound states. And here are the, the states that one finds in, in blue. So this is for a physical system. This might be the, the ground state, the evolution of the ground state as a function of A2 uh, for fixed lambda star. This is a ex first excited state. This is another one. Right on this line here, we have the FM of tower that, is, uh, that has that, that scaling factor that I mentioned. And that uh, in outside, it gives the evolution with A2, the breaking of scale, uh, this explicit breaking of scale invariance with A2. Now, um, for nucleons, uh, which are for component fermions, but nucleons are in this, in more or less in this region here. Helium-4 uh, atoms are somewhere around here. So um, helium-4 atoms are in a situation where uh, the, the excited trimer has been observed. It made the news a few years back. Um, the nuclear case is in a region where there is no excited state, bound state. But one can show that this, uh, this state, if you increase A2, continues as a virtual state of the, of, uh, of the atom plus dimer uh, scattering. And, um, and you can see the effect of this in, the, uh, in nuclear systems. Another interesting part of this, uh, this diagram here is the region here to the left where uh, the scattering length is negative, uh, the two-body scattering length is negative, which means that the two-body system has a virtual state. The um, three-body system, even though the two-body system is not bound, has only virtual states, uh, the three-body system is bound. Uh, and this is what's called a Borromean, uh, a Borromean system because the three body is abundant, but the two body subsystems are not. This is like the, the coat of arms of the Borromean family in Italy, uh, Borromeo family in Italy, and can be shown by this, 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 uh, this combination of, of uh, rings here. 
So uh, this is for the three body system. Um, so main lesson we have a near geometric tower of states. Uh, how many are going to be within, uh, are going to be materialized depends a little bit on how, how bad uh, scale invariance is going to be broken at the two body level explicitly. But now let's go to bigger systems. And you can, you might, the obvious question now is at what, what order I have a four body force when I go to the four body system. So calculation has been done for, for the, 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 the binding energies of the, uh, the four body states. And you, as you can see here for the ground state, for example, the binding energy converges with the cutoff once I have the three body force, but no need for a four body force. So a four body force does not need to be at, at leading order. Now, one the, the, an interesting discover uh, was that in the four body system, there is only, not only a ground state, but the first excited state is very barely below the, uh, the three plus one threshold. So I would like to call this, this two states the theme of descendants because they are the states associated with the theme of states. So the plot for, for the four, including the four body system is, is uh, sketched here. Uh, this is a function of one over a, so the curve is a bit different, but this is a two body threshold. Uh, sorry, one plus one threshold, uh, one plus two threshold. This is the one plus three uh, threshold, oh, sorry, the two plus two threshold. And you s these are the a sketch of the theme of level, uh, three body levels. And you, uh, this, these are the two four body states associated with each three body, uh, three body FM of, uh, FM of level. So there is a doubling in the number of states. Um, right at this line, that's the line where we have the, the unitarity limit. These numbers are, have been calculated very accurately by the Tuva. And you see that the four body ground state, or the four body, this four body state is a factor of about four times deeper than this state. And so this, this is not well represented here in this sketch, of course. And this, for the first excited level, is very, cl very close to the threshold. The factor is 1.002. Um, so what's happening here is that, qualitatively, is that for the case of four bodies, um, of course, there is the system wants to collapse without the three body force, but the number of three body forces grows faster than the number of two, uh, two body forces. So since it, the effect was effectively repulsive in the three body system, the four body system is stabilized and does not have a new scale at leading order. So because there is no new scale at leading order, that means that the four body energies scale with lambda star and I can trade lambda star by the binding energy of the three body system. So I have a correlation between the binding energies of the four body system and the, the ones of the three body system. And here it is for uh, the ground state in the first excited uh, state. Uh, this is called, these are called Chion lines because again, these lines were discovered in the, in the nuclear case uh, where again, people plotted different potential models and calculated the binding energy of the triton, the neutron, 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 uh, proton system in the alpha particle, which is neutron, neutron, proton, proton. And again, there is, they observed the correlation and again, the effect field theory in leading order gives a line. So uh, let's see how this, uh, again, exemplify this with helium four atoms. So now I simply go on and calculate also the four body, four body states and in, in, in more. So this is what happens for four, five, and six. So you see that the four body system that it converges with the cutoff, which confirms the, 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 that there is no four body force, and five and six converge as well, which means that there are no five and six body forces a leading order either. So we can predict everything uh, as far as, as, as 
well, everything that our computers allow us to. Uh, so here is a sample of the results for B4, B5, and B6, what we calculate in the effect field theory at leading order. And these are various potentials. These are the two potentials that I've been talking about, but people have done similar calculations. Um, and you see that, again, we get results that are within 10, 20% of uh, the direct calculations, which, again, means the theory is working much better than you would expect. If you, evaluate, if you estimate the binding momentum as a function of n from the binding energy per particle, you would expect that already at the five-body system, the errors at leading order would be 100%, but they are not. So the effect field theory is working better than you'd expect. Um, of course, there are t lines also for five and six bodies in any bodies that you, that you want. So these are, we call the generalized t lines for the, um, for the higher body systems. There are correlations between uh, the binding energies. Now, uh, what happens at NLO? Well, at NLO, we were expecting a four-body force at NLO. Are you? We did a Hello, Talita. Very good. Thank you. The How are you? Body, uh, the four-body uh, force. Uh, here is Monica. I'm replacing Talita today. So we did today. a calculation at ah, NLO okay. for the yes. four-body <laughs> Yes, in, in Moscow. Uh, ah, yes, everyone. So it looks the same. So here is the, uh, the, <laughs> How are you, the, professor? the result. This is for the PCKL. JS potential. So this is the result there. The, there's no cutoff there, so it's a flat line. So the uh, red line is the, the results that I presented before at leading order. And then we added the correction uh, at NLO of the two-body effective range. And here is the result we got. So the result is totally cut off dependence, dependent. So we do need a four-body force at this NLO. So once we have a four-body force at NLO, now we can fit it to the direct calculation. So that removes predictive power at the four-body level, but allows us to predict the binding energies for five and six. And here is what we get. Again, the, re the exact result are these lines here. In leading order NLO, leading order NLO for five and six. So again, you see that the, um, the NLO uh, removes a lot of the error of the leading order calculation, so the, calc uh, so the theory is converging. I'm going to skip this slide because it's quite technical. Uh, we have an argument to say that the n-body uh, body force for bosons appears at n, n minus three LO. So three-body force is LO four-body force is NLO, five-body force is N square LO. That has not been, that's a theoretical argument that has not been checked because nobody has done an N square LO calculation beyond three bodies. But here's the, the summary then. A leading order, we have a two-body uh, interaction um, that essentially carries out, incorporates the physics of the scat two-body scattering length and we have a three-body interaction that's essentially the physics of the three-body scattering length. At NLO, we have the range corrections at the two-body, and we have the four-body uh, force. And then at N square LO, we have corrections at two, three, and perhaps four and five-body levels. So um, let's go beyond N equals uh, six. So what are the effects of discrete scale invariance? Well, it has been found that the, this doubling of each state into to two once you add another body continues for a while. And there are indications that then you can have more than just a doubling um, of the states. Uh, but you're still, with these towers, you're still remaining, uh, retaining discrete scale invariance because you still have a relation, geometric uh, relation between different states. Now, for, uh, for me, is mo the most inter interesting thing is the correlation that's incorporated already in the Tion line. Because I have in leading order a single scale, this lambda star, I ha have a correlation between all the energies in the energy of the three-body system. So that means that at leading order, 
the binding energy of the n body system is a number which is universal well is a set of numbers that's universal times the binding energy of the three body system at unitarity k2 is 0 k3 by construction is 1 k4 is 3.5 that comes from the value of 4.6 for the binding energies themselves once i have allow for a factor of 4 and 3 here and the question is what are these numbers for larger these universal numbers for large for n larger than 5 so this is sort of the analog for bosons of the birch parameter so this is the calculation that lucas was uh, mentioning before the calculation uh, done by uh, stefano gandolfi joe carlson and uh, silvio vitiello at university of campinas um, we uh, simply calculate this, 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 uh, this ratio of energies as a function of the number of particles, of number of bosons. And we got all the way up to 60 because Stefano is a powerful guy. Uh, there are different points here. I'm not going to discuss them in detail. Suffice to say that as I they are cut off dependent, as the, the, the trend that you see here is a convergence with as the cutoff increases. So the, the blue points, if I remember, no, the, the, the dark points, if I remember correctly, are the highest cutoffs. And uh, we can, so what we have here is at low energies is that behavior that we saw already in four and five and six bodies. It grows, this, the, the, binding, the ratio of binding energies per particle grows more or less linearly with the number of particles. And, um, Von Stecher had uh, uh, improved that, that, that line a little bit and we went way, way over. Uh, and what we observe when, when you fit the best cutoff results um, with a curve is that the system shows saturation. So these numbers tend to a number that I'm calling k infinity here, which ex we extract as about 90, uh, up to surface effects, up to effects that account for the fact that this, uh, this is not infinite matter. So we can, uh, we could extract also the, 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 the size of the surface effects and then there are larger, there are uh, smaller uh, corrections to this. Now, a calculation of the same type had been done by helium for helium-4. So these are bosons at unitarity, but the calculation had been done for helium-4 by Vijay Pandhari Pandian collaborators already in the 80s. And they obtained results that are somewhat different. I mean, the, uh, the asymptotic value in that case is a factor of two larger than ours, and the surface effects have a different shape. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, we calculated things also like the, uh, the density or the, the, the average size to show, show that the systems indeed display saturation that you'd expect from a liquid. So if we look at the radius, for example, as we start adding particles, at first the system has a smaller radius, but then it reaches saturations and every time you add a particle, the, uh, the average size grows with n to the one third, which is an effect that you also see in nuclei, that the size grows with uh, the number of particles to the one third. And the density, as you see here, as you add, an, add particles, it goes more and more into a constant, um, constant density and then uh, in the middle, a decrease and then uh, goes to zero. Right? So this looks indeed like a liquid, a quantum liquid, because it's, it's intrinsically quantum mechanical. From the, uh, with a large number of particles and periodic boundary conditions, we can also obtain an equation of state. And here, is the, here are the results. And we can fit the equation of state with a quadratic formula. And again, extract the, the, this number at equilibrium, which is consistent with the number that we got before, as it should be. Um, we uh, calculated other things like the, the contacts, but I'm, not, I'm going to skip that because that's get somewhat technical. I just want to mention 
the, we'll go back to the comparison with helium-4 atoms, the calculation of Pandahari Panda and company. Um, so uh, ours is at unitarity, where, while theirs was not. It was uh, for helium-4 atoms. Um, so I list here the, the binding momenta for all the systems that, that we are considering so that you can compare. And you see that uh, in the case of the, um, the infinite, uh, the, the, the uh, unitary boson case, Q infinity is still, the, the typical momentum at infinity is still smaller than uh, the breakdown scale by factor two. 9.5 times 0 0.05, so about 50.5. But for helium, for atoms, you might expect that the theory breaks down somewhere, um, somewhere here in the middle. So that the helium-4 atoms are probably outside the uh, effect field theory. In other words, are sensitive, the, the matter is sensitive to short range physics. To get a better handle on this, people are interested in including corrections to the unitarity limit because uh, we have to include the scattering length, effective range. Uh, Lorenzo is working on this. Lucas has uh, work uh, at the three body level uh, to include the, the, the range uh, into the game. And we still have a long way to go to correct this, this picture here of, of unitarity, but the goal is to see once we include these corrections we should hopefully approach uh, the results for helium-4 atoms. So, but the message is that unitary uh, bosons uh, should form a universal liquid, strong interacting uh, unitary bosons should form a, a, a quantum liquid um, with these universal, universal properties. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to essentially skip the part on four component fermions, which are just a way to say nucleons, I mentioned before, spin up and spin down protons and neutrons, that makes for four, a fermion of four components. The masses of protons and neutrons are about the same. Uh, so if I neglect Coulomb interactions, uh, they are just uh, uh, identical four component fermions. And uh, for n up to four, for number of particles, uh, oh, typo. So we talk about, when we talk about nuclear physics, we talk about A, not N. Oh, well, N is the number of, the, traditionally the number of neutrons and Z, the number of protons. So what I meant here was A smaller than four and A bigger than five. But for A smaller than four, the system essentially behaves like bosons. Um, because the Pauli exclusion principle essentially have no, no uh, plays no, no big role. And that's why the Phillips and Chon lines were discovered way before in nuclear physics, but apply for bosons as well. There are also virtual three-body, four-body excited states that we could discuss. So essentially the same. But the big difference, of course, becomes when you go to, to five or more, because now the Pauli principle will play a role. So what I think is the most interesting part of this is to understand the, what, what are the effects of the unitarity limit and therefore discrete scale invariance once we go beyond, uh, beyond four. So let me sort of just sketch this. Uh, unitary bosons, we have a situation like this, like the, 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 uh, the ephemer of states, the ephemer of descendants here. The spectrum of nucleons uh, observed is very, it's very similar. Well, the deuteron is not quite at zero energy, it's not, unitarity is not exactly. You have a two states here, the, the triton and helium-3. But the alpha particle is about 3.7 instead of 4.6 times deeper than the three-body state. So we, that suggests that one can start with unitarity here for nucleons where you have this, this value here and then correcting perturbation theory. There are also excited states here that are not quite the same as for bosons because we need to take into account P waves and so on. But there is a chance that nucleons can be described starting with the unitarity limit, at least up to four. And we show that this, uh, let me skip this slide, we show that this uh, holds for up to four. Um, 
and again, I think the part that's most interesting is to go beyond four and try to find out the analog of this, those results for, for bosons. The universal numbers uh, that I now call kappa A, which are not going to be identical to, to bosons beyond, beyond five particles, because now we, we are dealing with fermions, but they should be universal in the sense that they are the same for whatever f for fermion, uh, for component fermion species I, I have. Um, we know empirically there is something called the semi-empirical mass formula that has the form of the one for uh, the equation for bosons, that the uh, this these numbers. Uh, approach a, a, a constant, there are surface effects, and then there are order effects. So the question is whether we can derive this from unitarity, uh, just like we did for bosons. The uh, first step in this direction was a calculation that uh, done by uh, Gezerlis and collaborators, uh, where we looked at the uh, system of eight for component fermions at unitarity. Um, and we found out is that the system tends to clusterize into two sets of four. So this is a single calculation, but uh, this, this is consistent with the fact that beryllium-8 uh, is two alpha particles, so this is good. So we, we're suggesting that perhaps clustering is a universal property of multi-component fermions, uh, unitary fermions. This is not inconsistent, as I said, with nuclear physics, uh, except that the, the problem is how can we, if, if that's the case, how can we perturb around the unitarity and get bound states for certain, uh, uh, for, uh, for component fermions? We know certain nuclei like lithium-6, lithium-7, oxygen-16 are stable. Um, they are not free clusters of alpha particles or alpha particles and deuterons and so on. And uh, the theory is giving that they are unstable already at leading order, just like the unitarity limit. So how we'll be able to, uh, to obtain this nuclei starting from unitarity is unclear. So, okay, uh, Lucas is getting patient there. So let me conclude. Uh, various uh, things that I hope you, you remember from these lectures. So from the very beginning, I tried to argue that uh, there's a intrinsic, uh, there are intrinsic quantum mechanical phenomena associated with weakly bound systems. Uh, they have some amazing features. I mean, the most obvious is this fact that they have size much larger than, than the range of the force, but this translates into un unintuitive phenomena like uh, Borromean uh, systems that can be three-body systems that are bound even though the two-body uh, subsystems are not. I tried to argue also in the first lecture that, uh, well, throughout the lectures, that EFT is a natural framework to describe universality and because its most general uh, dynamics that's consistent with the symmetries, and it allows for a systematic expansion. I used the uh, frequently results from the potentials as benchmark, but they are not necessary if I have enough data to to determine the parameters of the EFT directly. Um, I argue that systems near unitarity, uh, well, I should say bosonic systems near unitarity, uh, anything more than, I should, let me rephrase, anything other than two component fermions near unitarity can be described essentially by one parameter, lambda star, from the three body force. Um, and corrections come from uh, in next order from the two body range and for a four, from a four body scale. Um, we see that because of this one parameter and approximate discrete scale invariance, we can have quite complicated structure, well, complex structures are these geometric towers with several states, so it gets very, uh, very rich very quickly. Um, 
I argue that once you look, look at the, bound, uh, the, the ground states and uh, increase the number of particles for bosons, that they form a quantum liquid, a universal quantum liquid. Uh, Multi-component fermions tend to clusterize, uh, but we still need to uh, see how far we can go with the theory both in physical systems like helium-4 and in physical systems like, like nuclei, which are examples of four-component fermions. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Peter. We have time for questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for a nice collection of lecture. It's very hard for us to absorb everything. But it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but we haven't recorded, so we can see many times and then we approach optimization of understanding <laughs> when we see many times the same lecture. So uh -huh. thank you, Bira. Uh, thank you for the oh, invitation. My, uh, my yeah. question is, uh, in many parts of your talk, you spoke about liquid. About? Liquid. Liquid, oh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, my question is, uh, I know some criterion to decide if I have a gas or a liquid, okay. which is based on the ratio between uh, uh, interaction and kinetic part of the energy. Now, how you define if you have a liquid or a gas? Okay. What's the criteria? What, what kind of criteria you use? Fair, fair question. Um, I would uh, first start by disagreeing with your criterion for what's a liquid in the sense that uh, um, what comes from the potential, what comes from kinetic energy is not uh, observable per se. Depends in general on the cutoff. The ratio of interaction and yeah, but even that uh, depends on the cutoff in an effect field theory, so it's not observable. So, yeah, so um, that's a criterion, but I don't, I cannot apply that to, 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 to the effect field theory that deals only with observables. So what we use as criterion for this is just this mechanism of, of saturation, right? Which is something that you associate with a liquid. For example, the behavior of the radius as a function of, of the number of particles. That, well, first of all, the system is self-bound, right? And it reaches a point where as you add particles, the system, even though the interactions are overall attractive because the system is self-bound, right? They, I mean, so in a sense they are attractive, but then at some point, as you add more particles, the system doesn't get smaller and smaller, but achieves a, uh, uh, a growth that is with the number of particles to the one-third. Right, correct, exactly. That's why, in fact, I, I made this, uh, I mentioned here this, this semi-empirical ma mass formula for nuclear, which is just uh, also called the liquid drop model of the nucleus. So uh, I'm using that as a criterion of uh, calling something a liquid. I mean, I, in the end, I, I, I don't care what you call as long as you give a name to this type of behavior, and this is the behavior that is common to the unitary bosons uh, and to nuclei as we observe them. Uh, as I said, we, we are not at the point where you can derive that behavior for nuclei uh, from the theory, but um, that's the behavior you observe there. And I think this is a behavior that many people might agree is, is one way, to, uh, one reason to call this a liquid, right? And I call it a quantum liquid uh, in particular because this only arises as a, uh, because we have this three body force as effectively stabilizing the system, providing the saturation mechanism. And this three body force comes from the fact that the three body system, the quantum three body system 
in the absence of the three-body force would collapse um, and would not be renormalized. So it's intrinsically quantum in that sense. Um, so hopefully this is acceptable. <laughs> well, I have a question, which is, do you care to venture a power counting scheme for uh, bosons with unitary interactions? so that you can state it today and maybe somebody in a few years can prove you wrong? Well, uh, you mean more than this? Yeah. Because this is essentially what... Uh, so we claim, we, we venture to guess the order of the leading n-body force in that slide that I, that I jumped. So th this is my best bet for when n-body forces start appearing now, what we observed is that there is uh, fine-tuning at the two-body level, and then when we add more derivatives, the, the counting of this, these interactions here is not simply what you would expect. Uh, you might have expected that this is n square low because it has two powers of the, the low energy scale. And it's not true, and it's because of the fine-tuning of this, of this leading order interaction. So we understand the power, we, we know the power counting here, even though it's not no intuitive. Um, at this level here, what we know is that it looks like once we took in, take into account the fine-tuning here with this, then this has the power counting that, that you expect. So my, I would, venture that, I, that here adding two derivatives in this line here just adds two, two orders. And therefore I would guess that the same should be true for all the other ones. So together with that, um, that conjecture about the end body force and how to count derivatives, so that's what we think the power counting is, at least for bosons. But then, as I said, for, 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 for more than two component fermions, it becomes, a, a, we, we know less, right? But still we hope that it's something, a, a similar power counting, except that the, uh, the more body forces, when I count on the Pauling principle, should be more suppressed. So it's better in that sense. But that remains to, to be checked. Thank you. Any more questions, Lorenzo? So actually I actually have a question about uh, um, a, a lecture that we had last week, uh, but it's a... <laughs> Which I didn't... Sorry. Uh, uh. Um, but probably something that I, probably you mentioned also in the first lecture. So in the last week we had um, a nice um, uh, talk about Renato Passoa, in which, uh, in a different context, use contact theory, but instead of renormalizing with a cutoff, he renormalized using boundary condition of the wave function. So essentially, uh, he made a Monte Carlo calculation in which the wave function had a particular zero range uh, behavior. So to me, this uh, looked uh, very magical because um, essentially, he doesn't have any freedom of choice for the regulator or doesn't have to make one zillion calculation as uh, one usually has to do with a finite cutoff. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you if you can relate a little bit the two approaches and if there is any clue if this can be done for more than two particles. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is a proof for two particles, uh, which I provide a lo long time ago, um, that uh, the, uh, I mean, what you normally do with a boundary condition in the two-body system, for example, is that you take a, a fixed con a boundary condition, let's say at the origin with a fixed number, that's equivalent to, uh, to provide a, a contact interaction that will give the same scattering length. Um, and if you allow now your boundary condition to be not quite at the origin, and if you allow that boundary condition in principle to have dependence on the energy, you get higher terms in the effective range expansion. So that's simple to see at the two-body level. 
At the three-body level uh, and more, I can only appeal to intuition, right? I mean, in fact, Efimov did this, this, uh, this calculation more in terms of uh, original calculation, more, more thinking in terms of, of boundary condition. He looked at the three-body system, found an equivalent two-body system, and then used the boundary condition uh, to determine the uh, scale of, of the tower, to fix the scale of the tower. So I can only appeal to intuition that, well, if you have three-body force, a contact three-body force, it must be some information that you need at very short distances when the three particles are all together there. It should be a boundary, con a boundary condition about the incorporated in somehow in a boundary condition the three-body system. Uh, I know of no proof, but I'm also not, so since I don't believe that it's going to, to uh, not be true, uh, and I don't see the need to replace the many, body, uh, the many body forces by boundary conditions because the many body forces, just like the two body forces, are something that I can apply in higher systems. I, I, I haven't tried to, to, to check whether this is true, whether there, there can be a proof. Can I, can I have a comment? Uh, 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 very fast. So we're running a little bit late. You, so yes. uh, let's thank Bir again, not only for this lecture, but for the nice part. Okay, thank you. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon for you, Professor Nazarenko. Hello, everybody. Okay, let's start with the last lecture from Professor Nazarenko. Uh, please, Professor, you have the microphone now. Okay, thank you. So, um, in the end of last lecture, uh, we stopped uh, by uh, deriving the uh, famous kolmogorov uh, obuchov uh, uh, theory, in particular the uh, famous uh, k to minus 5 third spectrum. So, um, now, uh, let me uh, uh, now proceed to consider two-dimensional turbulence, okay. So, it's still an uh, overview of classical uh, turbulence, <clears throat> but perhaps Two-dimensional turbulence has even more relevance to uh, quantum turbulence, as uh, uh, you will see. So <clears throat> this is because, like I mentioned to you in the uh, beginning of the very first lecture, that uh, um, our quantum uh, model, uh, gross pedaevsky equation, um, has uh, two invariants. In addition to invariant of energy, it also uh, has invariant uh, invariant of uh, a number of particles. And the same uh, property uh, holds for two-dimensional turbulence. And um, so you see, in addition to energy, which is kinetic energy, so it's an incompressible fluid with density equal to one. So, <clears throat> and here is how I remind you the definition of one-dimensional energy spectrum. Um, uh, and the, um, uh, the second invariant is called entropy, and it's uh, actually integral of the square vorticity. And vorticity, I remind you, um, is the curl of velocity field, right? Okay, it is curl of velocity field, and therefore in, in Fourier space, for, for uh, Fourier transform of vorticity, uh, curl becomes vector multiplication of uh, uh, wave vector uh, and the velocity field, times i, of course. So uh, because of this factor k, and because we square the vorticity, it gives us k squared factor here uh, with respect to the energy integral. So in the entropy density is k squared times the energy uh, density. And this is, has a crucial uh, consequence in terms of the uh, turbulence here. And I also, just to jump in ahead, 
um, so or maybe even uh, lip, uh, uh, behind uh, uh, in the very first lecture again. So you saw that the it's the same case square coefficient that appears uh, in, as a uh, ratio uh, between the density of number of particles and the kinetic part, the the, the so-called non-interacting part of the energy in uh, gross kutaevsky equation. Remember, we had um, particles is the integral of mod psi squared and the uh, quadratic part of uh, energy Hamiltonian. So it was uh, modulus of gradient of psi squared. So that gradient squared gives you k squared, right? And also note that the, uh, if we are making analogies, then an a quantum analog uh, uh, or gross Pedersky analog of um, energy in classical fluid is actually number of particles, so mass, uh, or total mass. Uh, and the uh, analog of the energy is actually the, 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 the entropy integral. So, uh, so what uh, does it mean in terms of the turbulence there? Okay, so uh, let's consider a simplified, idealized, uh, a classical uh, picture, a, a kind of a generalization of uh, Richardson Kolmogorov uh, picture, where I have uh, in, in, in Fourier space, I um, have force in some wave number uh, kf, and I and I have dissipation, uh, but now I have dissipation both at very large wave number which I call K plus, and at very low wave number called K minus. I, I, I remind you, in uh, three-dimensional turbulence, we only consider uh, the uh, dissipation at very high wave numbers. But now, let's, cons uh, let's consider the forcing scale be somewhere in between. And uh, this uh, forcing and uh, dissipation wave numbers being uh, strongly separated in the sense that uh, strong inequalities uh, as written uh, here. Now, if I uh, let me, <clears throat> now what I note that because of this relation between energy and entropy, the um, rate of input of uh, energy depends on the rate of input of entropy uh, by, again, by the factor k squared. So if we input it at a, a wave number near K, uh, Kf. So this is going to be the uh, <clears throat> relation. So epsilon is as before the uh, rate of energy input and uh, um, eta uh, now uh, is the uh, rate of energy of entropy uh, input. And so, and they are related like this. So twiddle means approximate. <clears throat> and so now uh, I will present you so-called uh, Fjordov's ad absurdum argument, the argument that we suppose something which turns out uh, to be not true. So suppose, by contradiction, right, <clears throat> that energy is dissipated. Uh, okay, so suppose we, we reach a steady state. So we have force and injection and dissipation, either K plus or K minus, and we reach a steady state. And now we ask a question. Where is majority of energy is dissipated? Where is majority of uh, entropy is dissipated? And suppose uh, now that the energy is dissipated at wave number close to K plus, at, uh, at high wave number dissipation range. So then, because of the relation between dissipation rate of uh, entropy and energy, right? Again, because of this K squared factor, dissipation of entropy there will be K plus squared times epsilon which is, of course, much greater than Kf squared epsilon because K plus much greater than Kf, right? And, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, the latter, Kf squared epsilon, is of order of eta, as we uh, discussed in the previous screen, right? And so you see, we, we, we then uh, get that dissipation rate of entropy uh, is much greater than the injection rate of entropy. And this is not possible because the entropy is conserved. You cannot produce, you cannot uh, dissipate more entropy in steady state than you are producing. 
And therefore, we arrive at contradiction, which means that it's not possible for uh, the energy to be dis uh, dissipated at uh, uh, K plus, right? At, you know, in the rate uh, uh, comparable to the production rate. And so this means majority of it is um, uh, dissipated at K minus, okay? And that is what we get on this cartoon. So the majority of energy has to actually be transferred in the opposite direction compared to uh, what we saw in 3D turbulence. And that's the reason why the, uh, it is called the inverse energy cascade. It is inverse compared to what we get in uh, 3D. Uh, so in physical space, we have small eddies feeding on large, uh, uh, feeding large eddies and large eddies. And so this is why, this is uh, the reason why in atmospheric dynamics, which is, uh, uh, if you can see large scale motions, um, uh, much scale, uh, large scale uh, atmospheric motions. Uh, so the, we have generation of very large scale uh, vertical structures, cyclones and mm -hmm. anti cyclones leading uh, uh, to variations in the weather. And so now, <clears throat> uh, equally, respectively, we can uh, symmetrically apply the same speculation and assume and, and arrive at the uh, uh, contradiction. Uh, arrive at contradiction that uh, um, the uh, entropy cannot be dissipated at uh, low wave numbers and can only be dissipated at high wave numbers. So the, it is a direct cascade of entropy in, uh, in this case. Now, uh, the, uh, um, now we can apply the scaling argument of Kolmogorov uh, uh, and Obokov type. Uh, and obtain the spectra uh, corresponding to these forward and inverse cascades. And so, um, the, which was done first, uh, you know, the, in, uh, by Robert Reichman, who was the last living, uh, last living uh, um, um, student of Albert Einstein, and who got actually into to study turbulence because Einstein was fascinated by turbulence pro a problem and he, he, he gave him that uh, project uh, 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 as a PhD student. Okay, but um, uh, so applying the, this argument, uh, we, uh, we get that for uh, the energy cascade, because the argument is identical indeed. Uh, so uh, if we assume that energy, uh, uh, cascade ray or energy uh, epsilon is the only dimensional parameter which is relevant in, uh, in the inertial range of turbulence, we get the same minus five field spectrum as we had in 3D turbulence. Except that the constant prefactor uh, C uh, uh, it doesn't have to be the same. This is not exactly necessarily uh, the same dimensional as constant. And indeed, it, its value is. Uh, about four times uh, bigger than the one in 3D uh, turbulence. That is an experimental and, and numerical fact. Okay, now let's apply uh, the, uh, the same argument to the forward cascade of entropy, right? Now assuming that the only dimensional parameter which is relevant in this case is the uh, uh, cascade rate of the entropy because energy doesn't cascade in this range. And so dimensionally, uh, the, um, uh, the cost of k squared factor, again, so the uh, dimension of eta uh, is k squared dimension of uh, epsilon, which means that it has only a dimension of time, one over t q. And there is only one combination that allows us to build dimension of the energy spectrum out of dimension of eta and k, and this is the famous Kreitschmann's uh, 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 spectrum, minus three. Okay, and the experimental value for the constant is approximately 1.9. Okay, so, um, and the, uh, this dual cascade behavior, uh, uh, the reason I, I, I gave you that uh, 
uh, overview in detail because it has direct relevance to to uh, uh, Petayevsky uh, turbulence, turbulence in both Einstein points and optical fluids, and not only 2D but also in 3D because uh, in in contrast with the uh, uh, classical fluid dynamics, the uh, Gross-Petayevsky equation has two invariants, uh, both in 2D as well as in 3D. Okay, and so uh, we have uh, invariant of energy and mass, I remind you, right? Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will come back to that uh, in a little bit, <clears throat> uh, consideration in the uh, in, in Fourier space. Um, but I would, uh, what I want to tell you that because the um, because the analog of the number of of energy uh, is number of particles in a, in a gross Petersky model, it is actually the the uh, particles or the mass uh, integral that is going to converse uh, 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 cascade inversely from um, uh, to towards small uh, wave numbers. And this is the uh, the direct in, in, uh, indication for uh, the <clears throat> mechanism of non-equilibrium Bose-Einstein condensation occurring in uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> in such turbulent uh, 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 BC and optical systems. I will I'll tell you about that a little bit later in more detail. But for now, let's actually consider another approach. Uh, to um, kind of alternative approach uh, to uh, two-dimensional turbulence, which is valid directly uh, for both um, uh, classical fluids uh, and even more so for um, uh, for the quantized uh, uh, <clears throat> for uh, for systems with quantized vortices, uh, uh, namely. So the uh, I told you that in uh, uh, because the vortices are quantized, they are point-like like uh, uh, features, uh, in, uh, and you can, can consider them as a gas of uh, uh, randomly moving uh, positive and negative single charge vortices. Okay, so this uh, kind of system was actually considered by Lars Onsager uh, in uh, in the forties. And uh, it also led him to uh, he considered actually a thermodynamic approach. Uh, and it led him to believe that uh, the, uh, that the um, such uh, point vortex structures will have to cluster. Plus vortices will have to cluster together and minus vortices have to cluster separately, thereby producing global circulation pattern, which uh, 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 in which you can now connect as another way to see this inverse cascade phenomenon so that the, the uh, originally unstructured uh, energy uh, uh, injected in some unstructured small-scale field all of a sudden goes into this large-scale organized motion. So how does that happen? Okay, let's uh, uh, set up this the following pro, pro, uh, the, uh, uh, the following. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, situation. Let's consider a very large number of uh, vortex patches or, or, or point vortices in, in uh, an ideal 2D flow. And that will also be the model for superfluid flow uh, uh, in two dimensions as, uh, as I discussed before. So um, now, um, the, uh, in that point vortex model that we derived before, so each uh, uh, vortex would be moved by velocity field producing that at its location by the rest of the vortices. Now, um, I remember, so let's recall what we, we said before about point vortices, that the vorticity is contains of point vortices with circulations gamma, um, and the, the gamma J and the, uh, each of them application. So J vortex is moving 
uh, at a moving location as a delta function, uh, produce delta function distribution of RTC, and the motion of, of them is given by uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> set of differential equations. So also remember that the energy of uh, in such uh, point, point vortex system is equal to uh, this um, kind of pairwise, uh, uh, sum of pairwise energies, each of them have logarithmic potential of interaction. So uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, the, um, we have to cut off this energy at some size of the system. So to uh, to uh, because uh, well, first of all uh, the uh, uh, x has dimension and therefore to in order to be able to take a log you have to normalize it first time so some uh, another quantity has uh, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, dimension of length and so um, in uh, okay so. Um, What's the choice for uh, the? Uh, it actually could be quite arbitrary because, uh, as you can see, any different choice of R uh, is going to give you uh, simply some additional constant to the energy which is uh, conserved. So it doesn't matter which constant we choose. But convenient cho choice is is uh, actually uh, to choose it as mean intervortex distance. So if L is the size of our uh, box, so we have a two-dimensional L, L, uh, L by L square box, so the R and N is a number of vortices. So choosing R as L divided by square root of N, it, it will set us a distance, which is a mean intervortex distance. Now, um, uh, let's consider uh, Anzager's argument. Okay, let's denote by uh, phi capital of E, the phase volume corresponds to the vortex configuration with energy E uh, 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 PV. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, 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 such that, uh, okay, the, it's, uh, the energies are less than a given particular value E. So obviously, uh, from from construction, uh, so if uh, we have such energy uh, minus infinite, and uh, okay, so recall that this log function is not sign definite. It can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, depending whether you uh, this uh, uh, modulus of uh, uh, difference of coordinate goes to zero or to plus or to infinity, right? So uh, since we don't have any uh, states with uh, 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 increasingly small number of states with uh, uh, very uh, close vortices, we have uh, phi of minus infinity equal to zero. And uh, for, uh, for plus infinity, Okay, we have all the vortices uh, that are counted. Uh, all of the such energies will be less than total energy E. Therefore, we have the, uh, the total phase volume, which is L to uh, power uh, 2n. So why is it 2n? Because the, the uh, uh, phase volume consists of the coordinates of, uh, of some of the coordinates of all the particles, the direct uh, product. So each, uh, each uh, vortex is, uh, has two coordinates, x and, x and y. And therefore, for n vortices, the volume will be L uh, times uh, 2n. And so, um, and also, uh, and so we see that, um, uh, therefore, uh, uh, by, by construction also, it must be an increasing function, right? So therefore, if uh, the derivative of uh, phi with respect to e must be greater than zero. Uh, and so, uh, and, and then uh, uh, we, it's clear that the, for high energy configuration, uh, so, uh, so the, the density uh, of them uh, uh, goes to zero. Right, so this is just follows from what I written before in terms of phi that, that tends to uh, also to zero, 
okay, uh, asymptotes to constant value to both uh, when uh, e to, uh, goes to both uh, plus or minus infinity because phi ten asymptotes to constant. And so therefore, um, the, the value of uh, 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 omega uh, must reach an extremum, some, may reach uh, some maximum, and let's denote it by E uh, M, um, right? So such, in such point in this uh, maximum, the derivative of uh, uh, omega, which is uh, uh, equal to double derivative of phi is equal to zero. And now let's recall the definition of temperature. So the, the temp temperature is uh, uh, defined as one over uh, derivative of the entropy with respect to energy. So where uh, um, uh, entropy is defined in terms of the number of states, right? Uh, in our case, uh, like, like this, so it's a Boltzmann constant times log of the uh, de uh, of uh, derivative of phi, derivative of that uh, uh, phase volume, um, so uh, function omega, and so um, so, and therefore we uh, conclude following uh, Ansager that for e less than this maximum value, uh, we have a positive temperature, right, uh, and uh, uh, for energy is bigger than the maximum values, uh, uh, the temperature is negative. So, uh, so this is the famous prediction of an Ansaga uh, uh, of uh, existence of negative temperatures in such systems, uh, okay, uh, made by him in uh, uh, 91. And now let's see what, uh, what does it mean in terms of how uh, such uh, states are organized. So let's consider the canonical distribution of uh, vortices so that the probability of various configurations uh, of vortices are equal to this, uh, this uh, 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 so uh, Boltzmann-like uh, distribution. So the uh, curly brackets mean here the, uh, the whole set of coordinates of vortices. <clears throat> so e, uh, energy is obviously is the uh, function of the whole set of such vortices. And so they, they see that, okay, so now uh, we see that the, uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the uh, expression for the energy, right? Um, so the, uh, when uh, uh, difference between uh, coordinates of the particles is greater than R, they give positive uh, uh, contribution to, <clears throat> sorry, okay. Um, uh, yes, so, okay, I have to uh, uh, add something else here. So that in quantum system, quantized systems, gamma, uh, gammas are either uh, uh, plus or minus uh, four pi. Okay, so the single value. So we don't have multiple charged vortices, right? And so if you have like sign vortices, uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, or both uh, counter sign vortices, then this uh, product will be positive. And then uh, for uh, uh, large distances between the particles uh, of vortices greater than R, the log will also be positive, and this will give positive contribution to energy. Otherwise, for, for tight, uh, for closed by vortices, uh, closer than R, we will have negative contributions of energies. And the opposite, uh, vice versa, will happen for if gamma, if J and K vortex have opposite uh, polarities. And so the, uh, what follows from that, uh, for that, um, uh, uh, that, <clears throat> If you have uh, large positive temperatures, right? So the most probable states are those that correspond to vortex configurations with the largest negative energies. Uh, that is, uh, uh, okay, so you see in this exponent, right? So who is going to give us the biggest uh, number here, the probability? So if, if T is positive, so uh, largest, uh, ne largest negative energy will give you the largest value of the uh, exponential positive. 
and uh, so uh, uh, therefore the probability, right? So therefore we we, we have to uh, think of vortices that that are um, in which the uh, 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 positive and negative vortices are very close to each other, much closer than the like sign vortices. So this state is, you can think of as vortex, uh, as collection of vortex dipoles. So plus and minus vortices are close together and they propagate together uh, and they are separated uh, far, far apart from the other dipoles or isolated vortices. Okay, and uh, for, uh, so, uh, for negative temperatures, respectively, uh, the, uh, the biggest probability, conversely, will be uh, the one that, uh, that is with, with the, big, uh, the uh, biggest po positive energy. <clears throat> and, so, so, uh, and in this case, the light sign vortices must be closest to each other, uh, closer than the counter sign vortices. So this is where the clustering is coming. Uh, so you, you have the, all the pluses tend to cluster together and all the minuses cluster together. And we have picture like that, uh, more or less, like in this cartoon. So for positive temperatures, we have dipoles, right? So you see gray and black vortices have positive, uh, 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 opposite circulations and they are uh, kind of uh, on average, they're closer together than the like sign vortices. Whereas here, negative temperature, vortices, you see the vortices, so the gray ones uh, are mostly here and the black ones are mostly here. And so, uh, and if you think what kind of velocity field is produced by such negative temperature state, it will be like a big vortex uh, 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 cell uh, consisting of two big uh, vortices, one clockwise here uh, and counterclockwise clockwise in this corner. Okay, and uh, so sometimes in the literature, uh, it, these kind of states are called Onzaga states. Uh, and in fact, they observed, uh, they are, they have been a subject of uh, 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 recent attention in, in both numerical and, uh, and uh, experimental studies in quasi two dimensional uh, Bose Einstein condensates. <clears throat> Now, uh, the uh, one thing we have to add here is that uh, if uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, which state will be achieved depends on the initial configuration. So the, the final temperature really depends on the, of, of the initial conditions for the point vortices. And the thing is, if, if initial condition corresponds to uh, positive, uh, the positive energy, it will never become uh, of negative energy kind uh, later on. In particular, if we have random vortex con configuration, if you just randomly put a plus and minus vortices onto, uh, in a square basin, they will never organize in Anzagar fashion. That can change if we allow uh, to take uh, um, um, high energy uh, uh, vort uh, vort uh, vortices leak out of the system. And how does that happen? If uh, during the random motion of uh, point vortices, plus and minus vortex come together, remember I told you that in, uh, due to quantum pressure, in quantum, uh, in gross periodicity fluids, they're allowed to annihilate. They will kill each other, okay? And so, and that will change the energy of the total system uh, contained in vortices. Of course, the total energy will never change. It will be just transferred into acoustic component. But from point of view of just a vortex system, this energy will be lost. And therefore we can uh, lose it in such a way that we actually go to, to, uh, to the energy, uh, negative energy domain corresponding to negative temperatures and get vortex clustering. So therefore uh, we should expect such a, a condensation of uh, velocity circulation in big consagger like uh, like vortices in the, in the systems uh, in um, um, systems described by the gross capacity model. Okay, so um, now okay, so let me 
Okay, that, this was the vortex uh, uh, systems and uh, turbulence can contain vortices. And the vortex, uh, turbulence contained, uh, dominated by vortex properties is, uh, you can refer to it as Tron turbulence. In, in a sense that the nonlinearity it is, is essential, is strong compared to the linear term Laplacian and Gross-based model. Now let's consider the situation where the uh, field consists of weakly nonlinear waves, uh, and this is the main call. Uh, this is the uh, 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 this kind of state is called weak wave turbulence. Okay, so. Uh, and wave, uh, wave turbulence, uh, weak, weak turbulence can exist for different kinds of waves. And I already told you about three kinds of uh, waves. Uh, waves, the broad matter waves, uh, the waves in background of condensate, and the Kellyon waves uh, on uh, uh, spiral waves on propagating on vortex filaments. That is uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in both Einstein condensates. And uh, so let me consider, first of all, uh, the, um, in, in greater detail, the system, uh, the first case, so the De Broglie uh, matter waves. This means I don't have a strong uh, coherent condensate component at the ground state. Okay. And so what I have is I excitations uh, with uh, uh, non-zero wave numbers. And of course, okay, so this is, of course, uh, this big semantic uh, argument and confusion, what they call condensate. Is everything that is described by gross pedestrian equation condensate? Uh, and uh, why then uh, am I so much focused on uh, k equal to zero or not? So from our point of view, within gross pedestrian equation, we consider it as a model. And by condensate, we understand only a mode with uh, k equal to precisely uh, zero. Okay, all the rest could be uh, is turbulence. It could be quasi condensate if you if you have strong presence of component k equal to zero. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, now I write this uh, gross Pitevsky equation in Fourier space. Uh, and in order to write it in Fourier space, conveniently, I, I put it in a, in a periodic box. I consider it uh, uh, consider my uh, wave functions to be periodic in both in uh, in all g directions. I specify it's one, two, or three uh, with period L. And so uh, then I do Fourier uh, uh, transform. Uh, in, um, in X, in the physical coordinate. And so the uh, gross potential becomes like this. So here's my uh, time derivative term. So the Laplacian term will become like this. So where omega equal to k squared. And the nonlinear term gives me this convolution term. Okay, this sum. And uh, by delta, I mean, <clears throat> it's a chronicler symbol. Uh, that is uh, uh, equal to one if um, uh, k1 plus k2 is equal to k3 plus k and zero otherwise. And, and for simplicity, when I write sub subscript one, what I mean really is k1. And same here, what I mean one, I mean uh, summation over k1, k2 and k3. And so you see, so when nonlinear term is neglected, so I get these uh, linear uh, waves with classical, with a non-relativistic uh, sort of uh, relation between uh, energy and momentum. So omega equal to k squared, <clears throat> as, as uh, we discussed for linear waves, right? So let's now see the, uh, what, uh, uh, let's consider now the case where linear term is big, uh, a bit much bigger than nonlinear term, but still we take into account of the uh, nonlinear term. So the, no, the role of nonlinear term will be that some of the en energy will be transferred between the modes with uh, different wave numbers k. 
Indeed, if the, uh, it was linear system, then each uh, wave number k, each mode with wave number k, would preserve the value of its amplitude. So it's so-called superposition principle. And now we can have transfer uh, in a Fourier space. So uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the object that uh, um, we're interested in when we talk about distribution of waves uh, uh, among different wave numbers is the so-called the wave action spectrum. It's defined in this particular case as a, a, a mod uh, uh, psi k squared of a coefficient mod squared uh, multiplied by L over two pi to dimension D with L uh, uh, taken to infinity, right? So I take periodic box uh, eventually to, to large size. So when I do the, why do I need to multiply uh, like this by this L over two pi to power D? This is uh, so, uh, so that the, the object, the resulting object NK is L independent. This is to say that uh, the, we are considering limit where uh, uh, size of the box tends to infinity, but the uh, mean uh, energy density in physical space is kept constant uh, uh, independent of the size of the box. So, uh, okay, so, and here, uh, uh, unfortunately, so I will, uh, uh, because I, I still have things to, to tell you, uh, and derivation of the kinetic equation would probably uh, require uh, at least one or better two or three lectures on its own. So I'll refer you to, uh, to the extended le lecture notes that I uh, uh, shared with you <clears throat> for, for such derivation. And uh, for uh, 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 here, I only uh, mention uh, that uh, the, um, the closure, so, so the, the equation for evolution equation for NK, for the spectrum, uh, is derived uh, under assumption of uh, weak nonlinearity, as I already told you, but also the statistical assumption of random initial phases and amplitudes. Okay. So essentially, I consider some initial distribution of waves where uh, at each uh, wave number k, uh, all of the Fourier coefficients are independent one from another and their phases are random. And you see, sometimes people in physics literature refer it as RPA, random phase approximation. But what's important here, and actually many other uh, uh, cases in field theory, that it's not only phases that must be in uh, random, but also the amplitudes. So it is very important for to obtain the final closure that these coefficients are independent, random independent variables for each wave number case. So K1 and K2 uh, will not know about statistics about each other. And so therefore I emphasize it's random uh, uh, phases and amplitude uh, fields that we are dealing here with. So, uh, uh, yes, so and then um, if um, I do these assumptions and uh, I use this, uh, 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 okay, uh, uh, wave uh, turbulence approach. So I derive an equation for, uh, for wave action spectrum. And this equation is, uh, 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 has resemblance of the Boltzmann equation, uh, just usual Boltzmann equation for colliding particles. Okay. In fact, you can uh, consider in these equations, you see the momentum, okay, is uh, <clears throat> analogous to the momentum of, uh, uh, of particles that are colliding. Particle with momentum K and momentum K1 colliding and, uh, and producing particle with momentum K2 and K3 and uh, the, uh, the total uh, and the moment, uh, momentum uh, must be conserved, therefore this delta function. And omega uh, respectively corresponds to the energy uh, of the particles and delta function 
of such uh, four omegas corresponds to conservation of energy. So this equation was actually first obtained uh, in the end of uh, uh, 20th of last century, uh, almost, almost uh, 100 years ago by Nordheim. And uh, uh, it was called quantum kinetic equation in, in uh, uh, obtained in slightly more general form. So he, first of all, he obtained it for, uh, uh, <clears throat> so, so this equation that you see here is a classical wave uh, limit of Nordheim's quantum kinetic equation. Whereas the other limit uh, where, I, so this limit corresponds to occupation number at each site uh, is much greater than one. And the opposite limit where occupation, quantum occupation number is much less than one leads to classical Boltzmann equation, Maxwell-Boltzmann equation. And also Nordheim uh, uh, derived it for two, two uh, situations. For uh, bosons, the case which you see here, this is a bosons, a bosonic case, and also for fermions that, uh, that had different sign in the quantum uh, uh, Boltzmann equation. Okay, so um, now um, uh, the uh, also without also by pa in passing, I'll just tell you that a similar approach uh, taken uh, can be used, it has been used to describe uh, Bogolubov waves on the ground of condensate, in which case the the equation has similar structure. And you see the conservation of energy and momentum uh, in this case. But now you have three uh, momenta and three energies. Because actually, in this case, the, it's a three-wave interaction and not four-wave interaction as before. In, in this case, two phonons can merge and as a result produce the third phonon. And therefore, conservation uh, so, uh, so you see K1 and K2 phonon merge and produce K, and therefore conservation has to be in these three uh, uh, <coughs> triple uh, triad form. Okay, so also uh, the, uh, the waves uh, uh, that I mentioned, the quantum, uh, so the unquantized vortices, the Killian waves, uh, so the kinetic equation for them uh, has the following structure. So it's now, uh, it's actually where one, uh, one uh, wave breaks into three waves and vice versa. So this is one to three or three to one process. And therefore we have here uh, four momenta and four uh, uh, energies, but you can see the signs, the sign of K1 is different than the one on the previous screen here, you see? So you have one into three rather than two into two. Okay, so um, let me now uh, um, return to the question uh, of the uh, conservation of energy and mass and, and consequences. Uh, okay, so the, actually, if I, consider uh, this equation. The, uh, so then I can derive uh, very easily the uh, law of total mass conservation and total uh, energy conservation. Simply by, say for mass, I have to integrate right and left hand side over K. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, for, uh, for energy, I have to multiply by omega K, which is equal to k squared and also integrate. And so I, what I will see that uh, the uh, integral of, uh, um, <clears throat> so the mass uh, means that the integral of in, uh, 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 decay is uh, constant, which is natural uh, because n is in fact um, mod psi k squared. So it's exactly the same mass as in the usual gross equation. And energy, you see it's omega k, which is equal to k squared in our case, times n k dk equal to zero. Again, this k squared coefficient, you see. Okay, 
but uh, but in this case uh, the uh, the energy within this approach in the kinetic equation uh, corresponds to just the first part uh, of energy in gross petayevsky energy uh, namely to non interacting energy which is natural because the uh, our approach assumes small nonlinearity meaning that the uh, um, the free energy the the non interacting energy is much greater than the uh, interaction energy. And so uh, you see, just because of this k squared factor, which is omega, the field of argument that I uh, told you in the beginning of this lecture is identical to 2D to, to turbulence. But now the role of uh, energy uh, of classical fluid is played by the mass, so we, or wave action. Okay. So we, we have uh, the mass or, or particles cascade to low momentum states and the energy cascade to high momentum states. Okay, so um, which, uh, okay, so which has, uh, uh, okay, let me just jump a little bit. Uh, okay, and, and uh, okay, here. Uh, so um, which has actually a very nice interpretation in terms of uh, what uh, can happen to both uh, turbulent both Einstein condensate in the uh, in experiment? So suppose we uh, we force our system and introduce uh, excite some state somewhere uh, with uh, energies intermediate, not very low, uh, not very high in the magnetic trap, and let the system uh, evolve, and then according to this dual cascade behavior we see that the particles must cascade to ground states and energy uh, cascade to, uh, to high energy states. And so the first process is obviously uh, corresponds to non-equilibrium non process of, uh, uh, of condensation, uh, whereas the process of energy uh, going to high <coughs> uh, momentum states uh, corresponds to, uh, to, to uh, evaporation, if you have the uh, height of your uh, barrier, as in some recent experiment was made uh, synthetically uh, finite height, so the, uh, when energy, when particles reach to these energies, they, they, uh, they escape from the system. Okay, so you see th this has very nice interpretations. Uh, in, uh, in, in terms of the uh, uh, real systems. So uh, now, finally, what I want to discuss uh, with you. Okay, well, first of all, uh, the what was uh, noted long time ago by Nordheim and Piles, so that the kinetic equations that, uh, uh, for <clears throat> uh, have uh, equilibrium solutions corresponding in. Uh, 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 corresponding to uh, thermodynamic equilibria. In particular, for the uh, equation, four wave equation uh, that we are uh, considering, it's a so called relay gene spectra. Uh, so, we're uh, <coughs> written here, uh, which corresponds to equipartition of an invariant, which is a linear combination, uh, arbitrary linear combination of energy and mass invariant. Okay, so, but these solutions were, uh, uh, you know, uh, not so interesting um, from turbulence point of view, because they don't have cascade, uh, uh, like in class, a Kolmogorov type cascade, like a classical turbulence. And so what is, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> okay. So what is uh, more interesting, uh, though, that, that was from, from uh, starting, that was uh, noted in uh, 1965 by Zakharov, okay, some, uh, uh, who made some pioneering discovery that the kinetic equations have some non-equilibrium uh, finite flux solutions uh, analogous to kolmogorov uh, obuchov uh, spectrum. And, uh, uh, and uh, nowadays in literature, they're called the magorov zakharov spectra. And moreover, this spectra can be obtained as uh, not only from the dimensional argument, uh, uh, 
uh, as in uh, uh, classical hydrodynamic turbulence, but also as exact uh, analytical solutions of kinetic equations using a very, a very clever trick called uh, uh, Zakharov transformation. But we are not going to consider Zakharov transformation. Again, um, uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that would take us too far from our course. Uh, and a uh, limited amount of time that we lived with. But we consider only dimensional variation of, uh, of this Kamagora Zakara spectrum. So you see, by definition of 1D energy spectrum, right? You remember <coughs> that energy spectrum is equal to particle of the spectrum multiplied by the frequency, k squared, right? But also to make it 1D, we have to integrate it over a shell of radius K in uh, Fourier space. So to make it an uh, isotropic uh, one dimensional distribution. And because of energy conservation, in absence of uh, force and dissipation, it has to be equal to minus uh, K derivative of, of, of uh, energy flux. This is just simply. Uh, energy balance equation written in most uh, uh, general form. But now, uh, uh, given the kinetic equation, we can, uh, we can write out this uh, term. This is nothing but, so you will know equation for n dot in terms of the, uh, the integral and kinetic equation. So we substitute it and we have this term. <coughs> so to, uh, uh, if we do that, so then we, um, we can substitute the, uh, the spectrum uh, in the power law form, uh, nk equal to k to power x, and uh, balance the dimension of wave number, which is an external variable with respect to the integral that will appear here from the kinetic equation. Balance the uh, power of uh, k uh, uh, on the right hand side and left hand side of this equation. Okay, so if we do so, uh, well, okay. So it's uh, uh, what I what I write here. It's actually the expressions in the most general three wave kinetic equation and four wave kinetic equation. So never mind that. I won't I won't go into detail, uh, but. Um, I want to mention specifically what happens to the uh, what will happen to the uh, the uh, in, in case of uh, De Broglie waves, the matter waves, uh, if we do that, right? So the if we from the collision integral if we uh, compute the power of k, uh, we we have uh, the, the following. Uh, expression. Um, so alpha is the homogeneity degree of, uh, of frequency, which is two in our case. Beta is uh, zero in our case. It's the uh, matrix element of interaction. So we want, for example, if we want constant flux of particle spectrum, we want uh, this uh, uh, constant means it's independent of k. So it, has to be equal to k to power zero. So we must equate this uh, uh, exponent to zero, and that gives us uh, the power of, uh, of the spectrum, of our power law uh, spectrum, the scaling uh, <clears throat> in this case. So, uh, and same we can do with the um, energy cascade, uh, so which cascades forward in this case, uh, and also calculate the, the power law index. And so as a result, we, we get that the index, the uh, power law uh, index is equal to minus D for the direct energy cascade and is equal to D's dimension and minus D plus two thirds for the inverse energy cascade. Okay, so uh, this actually, things are not as, uh, um, so I'm skipping a lot of things obviously. I'm just giving you a flavor. Um, and there has been recent experiments that, uh, uh, you know, particularly directed at uh, checking the 
this prediction for the direct energy constraint in 3D by near Nervon and, and his collaborators. <clears throat> and uh, he found uh, pretty good uh, sort of agreement, even though the power law coefficient was slightly uh, uh, different. So it was instead of minus three, it was minus 3.5. So, by the way, for people who are familiar with this work, and I, I just could simply note in passing that the explanation, we know explanation for this disagreement. That's because this, uh, this spectrum is, is logarithmically no local. And if we uh, make a logarithmic, logarithmic uh, correction to this spectrum, then agreement will be perfect. As, uh, as we proved uh, uh, recently uh, by direct numerical simulation of three-dimensional <clears throat> uh, gross Petersky equation at high resolution, at, at resolution 1024 uh, uh, cube. Uh, you might not think that this resolution is high, uh, but it is indeed high if you deal with uh, wave turbulence because interaction is weak and the transfer of energy in Fourier space is extremely slow and you have to wait for very, very, very many uh, wave periods for the system to find its uh, uh, steady state. Okay, so, and here, just instead of uh, conclusion, this, is, uh, this story is infinite uh, and, uh, and it's far from over, far from being, being finished. With a lot of a lot of uh, great exciting discoveries to be made, uh, not only in theoretical or numerical uh, <coughs> side, but mostly even more importantly uh, experimentally, particularly to set up the inverse uh, uh, inverse cascade uh, situation that hasn't been done yet, as far as I know. So okay, so I. I uh, uh, here I just put uh, uh, just just an illustration, a cartoon, what happens in 2D uh, uh, gross test equation simulation when a flow goes past uh, past an obstacle, and so if the velocity is high enough, it produces vortex dipole that can go through the system, bounce back, uh, and uh, and produce more and more vortices, and finally you get a lot of vortices and that's a uh, turbulent state uh, with vortices and acoustic waves in between. Okay, so I guess uh, I'm, I'm stopping here. My, uh, my course has finished and I'll take uh, 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 questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, we have time for some questions. Thank you very much, Nazarenko, for the nice set of lectures. And I'm sure that uh, we all learn uh, more by looking. Each time you speak, we learn a little more. <laughs> Uh, you know, I like your conclusion that you say that, uh, uh, well, the conclusion is that uh, we still have a lot of things to understand. <laughs> yes, yeah. of course, yeah. yes. And, and that's very nice. Now, uh, my question to you is, uh, normally I, I, I see that uh, we always try to, to classify uh, the turbulence uh, by one of the classical analog we have. So either we have a Komogorov type spectrum which is characterized by some distribution of the vortices and some reaction among the vortices, or we have uh, the super quantum, uh, I'm talking about the Bose-Einstein condensate, or we have the wave turbulence, or but, you know, we have this finite system that maybe we have something that's always in between all this classification. So, uh, and in that, in that case, uh, we should look into the system uh, in, a, in a more, not looking for individual mechanism, but uh, being able to accommodate much more facts than uh, we normally do. Uh, can you just uh, 
what do you think about this, right? I mean, what's your idea about this? Uh, that instead of being doing analogy, we should look for the system as a unique, uh, small, finite size system. Yes, thank you, Vanderlei, for this uh, uh, <clears throat> very important question. So, uh, I, in my opinion, you know, uh, the, the, we, we should uh, aim to achieve. Uh, um, we, we should aim in two directions, uh, at least. Okay, so in one direction is that we we should aim to kind of. Uh, attach ourselves to some reference uh, theories and try to uh, to set up states either to validate or, or disprove uh, uh, such states and, and and from this point of view perhaps uh, maybe uh, we should try to achieve a system where it's only waves and no vortices uh, uh, where there is a direct cascade like uh, Navon did uh, or inverse cascade, which is of great interest, and I hope you and I, when we resume this, uh, our project, uh, we uh, will look at. Um, okay, or vortex uh, uh, systems, uh, uh, where even if it is just one single vortex and the sending billion waves in it, this is an interesting system. But all I'm talking about is uh, 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 trying to set up more simplified uh, system, try to isolate the uh, other effects uh, to minimize them and so that we are more uh, 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 closer to something that we can treat theoretically and therefore advance further. Or uh, uh, in the second direction, of course, is to try to push the theory in the direction to, to include, uh, uh, to come to terms that in the most general situation, uh, it, it's never pure. It's, uh, it's going to be always a mixture of vortices consist consistent with waves. So just like on this, uh, uh, on this screen here, you have both vortices and, uh, uh, and waves. And um, if this is one of my greatest uh, so, uh, sort of interests at the moment, uh, is to, to understand how uh, wave turbulence theory is modified by presence of vortices. So ideally, I would like to, uh, to, uh, to, to get at the description, even if it is uh, simplified or phenomenological, where I have two species, random waves and vortices. And these two species interact with each other and exchange energy, affect each other. And I would like to predict uh, how does it affect uh, vortex species, whether it makes them uh, replicate or annihilate in a at a particular rate with particular scaling. How does the random wave component affected by vortices, how, uh, for example, scaling of, of its spectrum, how is it affected? So I think, you know, uh, it's like that two, two way direction I'm advocating, uh, both in direction toward the more pure setup to, uh, to, to, to connect with existing theory and for theory to, to push to more complicated setup uh, toward the experiment. Sorry for long and convoluted uh, answer. Uh, it's more philosophical, I guess, uh, Wanderlei. Uh, hi, Sergei. Thank you for the nice uh, lecture. Um, I was wondering when you uh, wrote the GP equation for in the Fourier space, you use the fact that the dispersion relation goes as k square, and that is true yeah. in the limit of uh, large wave numbers, right? Uh, at least for the Vogelie bob uh, this dispersion relation. Uh, so my question is, for the small wave numbers, you would have a, a, a linear dispersion relation, so could you I don't know, observe some wave turbulence in that regime? Absolutely, yes. So, the, in, the, um, in fact, so I wrote this equation for you, perhaps it was too brief. Uh, so, this equation on the top, this is exactly for the case where we have waves on top of condensate, right? And so, an omega k here is a Bagalubov uh, omega. 
and uh, in the limit of small k it will uh, be precisely acoustic type and so it's a, it's an interesting example of wave turbulence <clears throat> but it's uh, it's also interesting because in fact acoustic turbulence is a very uh, degenerate uh, object because acoustic waves are um, have no dispersion and there's been a long standing debate whether a wave uh, a turbulence, a weak wave turbulence approach is applicable to uh, uh, acoustic uh, uh, turbulence or not. And the, uh, I, I guess the opinion right now, the most accepted opinion, even though there is no strict proofs, that in three dimensions, yes, and two dimensions, no. Uh, okay, so you can't, you, uh, in three dimensions, you have enough space for the waves to disperse. Uh, get out of, away from each other so that to, to prevent these bad uh, uh, wave steepening and breaking effects that can occur in lower dimensions. <clears throat> uh, however, having said that, uh, Georgia, myself, uh, Adam, uh, uh, and Victor Lwolf, just uh, uh, at the moment we have a, a paper submitted on two dimensional acoustic turbulence precisely for this system. Uh, or Bagalubov waves, where we take into account the fact that it is not strictly Bagalubov, but there is also some dispersive correction to it. And so we have some theory and numerics about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have two more questions for YouTube chat. Let me read it for you. Uh, this question is from Diego Hernandez. Uh, is there something like polar as turbulence in 2D in the sense that there are more vortices of one sign than the other? And uh, how the scaling laws change? Okay, could you please uh, repeat? I did not get the first sentence. Uh, he said, uh, is there something like polar as turbulence in 2D? Polar, 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 polar tones. Polar tones. Uh, he means that there are more vortices of one sign than the other, so he's ah, wondering okay. about yes, uh, yes. polarizers. Of course, yes, yes, there is a, uh, yes, <clears throat> in 2D. Okay, so, right, so what happens in 2D if, you're, if you introduce more vortices on one sign than another, so you will have an effect of global rotation, right? So, in the, in the most extreme case, you have all vortices of the same sign, and they will organize themselves in some sort of lattice that will rotate, right? We know that from superfluid experiments and, you know, uh, uh, very classical. So, now you, you can introduce species of other sites, and it will be like, uh, like turbulence on, in a rotating uh, frame, which is kind of interesting because it, 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 you could think of it, you know, like... Um, Analog and classical fluids, you know, the, you have rotating turbulence, uh, a rotating fluid, for example, Earth's atmosphere is rotating, right? And it's producing the Coriolis effects and stuff like that, that does affect uh, and, and change properties of turbulence. So, uh, in, indeed, the scaling laws, uh, we expect uh, that, uh, that could be uh, different in that case. Especially in, in 3D, you know, so in 2D, perhaps maybe uh, less difference. Well, okay, it, it depends how you organize the vortices. You can organize them uh, rotation to make rotation uh, unequal, the rate of rotation uh, uh, um, as a function of uh, distance from the center, in which case you will have a uh, gradient of Coriolis force, which leads to so-called beta effect. Beta effect will lead to a completely different type of waves, uh, like Rossby waves. So I don't think this kind of things were studied, uh, have been, has been studied in, um, in the context of quantum fluids. What's the analog of uh, waves, uh, uh, turbulence in rotating fluids, or, or just uh, what they call it, uh, uh, quasi just trophic turbulence, Rossby waves, zonal jets. So that would be an interesting, uh, uh, from both theoretical and numerical um, 
in the experimental uh, uh, point of view, of course. So thank you for the question. Uh, okay, the last one is from Sanjay. She said, in 2D turbulence, we put Ekman friction by hand to dissipate energy at large scale. Is it possible to derive it starting from 3D to 2D Navier stocks? Okay, in 2D, uh, the Ekman uh, friction is put by hand uh, where? In quantum systems? Uh, okay, Ekman friction, of course, it, uh, it, derived, it, it refers to um, uh, to, to boundary layers in classical fluids, in rotating, you know, rotating uh, classical fluids. I, I don't know who is doing artificially by hand, perhaps, perhaps in quantum fluids uh, people also consider some uh, similar things and uh, consider Ekman friction, so I'm not aware of that. So of course, you know, so the friction in the case of uh, um, quantum fluids would be uh, due to vortices uh, interacting with the bottom of the, with the, the boundaries of the domain. Okay, so it could be some sort of pinion effect, for example, that could try to attach the vortex to the boundary, uh, uh, or, or if you move it, it will kind of experience some resistance and affliction. So, so I'm afraid I'm not too, I, I don't understand precisely what uh, the question is. So I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, guessing here. So if the, that if the person uh, would uh, clarify a little bit uh, this question, I could answer. Or, or maybe ask me later uh, separately in email. Uh, I think there is no, no more question about this. Um, OK. Uh, let's close this set of great lecture from Professor Nazarenko by thanking the game, please. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Professor.